doesn't want to answer no, that not one. Here. <laughs> it's, it's a rough uh, time right now. Okay. I'd like to call to order this meeting uh, Monday, August 6th of the Citizens Involvement Council. This is a gathering of all the neighborhood representatives from the neighborhoods, uh, 12 neighborhoods of Oregon City. With that, I pass it on to um, Katie Riggs, our CIC liaison. Don Wright, Barkley Hills. Here. Walter White, Barkley Hills Excused. Howard Post, Kanima. Paul Edgar, Kanima. Here. Larry Hanlon, Caulfield. Here. Rachel Gunderson, Chamber. Here. Amy Wilhite, Gaffney Lane. <clears throat> Kathy Logan, Hazelgrove. Hogan. Oh, yeah. sorry, Hogan. I don't know why I said sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tom O'Brien, Hazelgrove. Here. Steve Anderson, Hillendale. Here. William Gifford, Hillendale. Here. Michael Berman, Main Street. Here. Bill Daniels, McLaughlin. <clears throat> Alice Watts, McLaughlin. Here. Tom Guile, Park Place. Present. Steve Van Haverbeek, Park Place. Here. Bruce Danielson, Rivercrest. Eileen Olson, River Rivercrest. Here. Ingrid Rickenbach. South End. Here. Here. David Rickenbach, South End. Here. <laughs> I would hope so. Mm -hmm. And John Lewis. Here. And I think we usually go around. Did I miss anybody before? There's quite a few people in the audience yeah. that we may not have gotten. If you just introduce yourself, because he takes minutes. Eli, I'm going to start over on this side. Eli, 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 Oh, excuse me. I didn't catch the name. My name is Karen. 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 Wild. Wild? W-E-Y-L-A-N-D-T. <laughs> W-E-I-L-A-N-D-T. Wild. Did you folks sign in as well? So we'll have it on the sign in. Thank you. Yeah. Well. More people than I've seen. <laughs> Providence. <laughs> one, one more. One more. And we got you too. Oh, and we got you. Yep. We just got you. So. Okay. We have a few presentations this evening, uh, and we'll start with the guest speakers first before we go into our other business. And with that, um, <coughs> it said just Renee, but it sounds like Renee's got a few backups with her here tonight from Providence Willamette Falls Medical Center. Um, reporting on new program and service service line, fifteen minute presentation uh, with five minutes question and answers of our. It said Russ was not here. Russ is not here. Oh, Russ is out ill today, so um, we came in his place, and I'm sure he uh, would rather be here than home, not feeling well. So um, I'm Renee King. I am the public relations manager for Providence Willamette Falls Medical Center, and in. Um, Late May, we announced that we're going to be adding a new service to the hospital, and I apologize for having my <coughs> back to you folks. Um, and then um, we presented uh, the same information to the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association in July, and um, we'll also be presenting the same information to the Trillium Park Homeowners Association, which is part of the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association, but it is directly behind the hospital and we have a close working relationship with them. So we did want to come and be able to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and um, share the, the latest news. And at this point, I'd actually like to turn the information over and the presentation over to Herb Ozer and to Karen. Wyland and they we've got a little PowerPoint set up for you and um, Herb can tell you a little bit more about what we're um, adding. Okay. Thank you and it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this. Um, what this proposal is is we are adding a service line in essence say another service to Providence Willamette Falls and we are adding it to the Sheldon space above the current ED emergency room area that was built a uh, number of years ago. So it's Sheldon, it's not new building. Uh, it is, 
as you see above, uh, as on the screen, it's 14,000 square foot area. We are going to be putting in a psychiatric unit for adolescents and children in that unit, in that area, and um, we are in the design phase at this moment. And as you see on the screen, 16 adolescent beds and six child patient beds. It's a two-nurse station model because we keep the children and the adolescents separate uh, for clinical reasons and for care reasons, good programming that way. It also provides an outdoor space for the children to play in, which is, for my mind, essential for the good clinical care we want to provide. And also, uh, it is unique in that the outdoor space is contiguous to the area we're building out without it getting in the way of having the children move through the hospital or actually providing any risk of access outside of the hospital because it's an internal roof area. Um, so it's actually very protected, which makes us feel wonderful to be able to provide that opportunity. We'll also have a small admin space on the first floor where our nurse manager and our medical director will have space as well as our fellows and psychiatrists who be, will be practicing on the unit. Um, I'll let you do this one. <laughs> so for you to know, I am the exec for Behavioral Health Services for Providence, and then Karen has um, got many titles, but she's basically in charge of the development and the project for building out this, this space. I thought this was a pointer bit. Oh. <laughs> I was just going to point out that the, um, so this is the, the hospital footprint right here. Um, and this is the space um, that we're building out right here. So this is actually the, uh, the entrance into the emergency department. This is actually the mm. front parking lot of the hospital. This is Division Street. So this is the shelf space that sits directly above the emergency department that we're talking about. Um, and then this is the little area that we're making into the activity area right there. Excuse me, when you say shell space, it's S-H-E-L-L -L space? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So when that building was built, yes. it's two-story, and the top of it, the second floor, is empty. Yeah. I understood. I just wanted to be clear for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm probably listening here. Shell, yeah, shell space. Yeah, so. so in terms of the services we'll provide, it is a psychiatric unit. It's for children and adolescents in acute needs from mental health problems uh, that would include schizophrenia, bipolar illness, some children with autism will be treating on that unit, uh, children with other psychiatric illnesses of that sort. It is a short stay acute care unit, so the length of stay is approximately seven to eight days, uh, no more. It is not residential treatment. It is not treatment for children with conduct disorder or any kind of criminal issues. It is specifically for psychiatric issues. Um, and again, we have a unit currently at Providence, Portland, but that unit is in the older part of the hospital and does not have near what we will be able to do for the children here in terms of sensory uh, treatment and uh, obviously activity treatments. It increases our capacity to do groups and segment the population according to the, the needs, um, almost double, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, where they're located now, Providence, Portland, they're um, basically as semi-private rooms. The unit that we're designing here <clears throat> is all single room except for two rooms in the adolescent area that will be semi-private. So we have the capacity to care for a lot more children. Um, it's probably one of our most vulnerable populations of, of patients that we serve. We take care of kids that are um, as little as three years old um, up to the age of 17 for the adolescent units. And so it's a very special population of, of children and um, we're actually very fortunate to have this opportunity to be designing a state-of-the-art unit for this very, very um, special group of kids. Can, can I ask a question? Would, would you be bringing in criminally? No, right. she said no. No, no criminal? No. no. Okay. Uh -huh. Is there more? Um, yeah. I think that's... Any questions? Yeah, we'd rather take the questions because yeah. we won't know what you want to know. Okay. Yeah. Question by... Uh, a couple of questions. <coughs> One is the, uh, the rooftop play area. I think is a brilliant idea. I like mm -hmm. that very much for the kids to get the fresh air and so on. It, and is, as it is on a rooftop, uh, how is that... Uh, protected from the edges, is it, sure. is it so, an interior courtyard or what? Yes, yes. an interior courtyard. Ah. See, if you, if you see, 
all of that around there is surrounded by higher walls. I think they're 14 foot walls except for one area which will actually have some kind of decorative fencing to also protect the children from getting to another part of the roof. So the area is really very well enclosed. It's as Excellent. secure as we could make it. I, I couldn't I, I'm sure that it would better. be. I just wanted to be clear that it was. No, no, yes. It wasn't like they're going up there and they can get a view of the city or anything. No, nope. no. <laughs> the, uh, the, the possibility question, of seeing Mount Hood, maybe. <laughs> the second question that I had is more significant insofar as impacting the uh, impacting the neighborhood and, and mm -hmm. the city generally, but specifically that neighborhood, and that is regards to traffic uh, with a, additional services like this, which is a great thing to bring to the city. Thank you very much for that. What is, uh, was there an additional traffic study done on? Well, actually, this, is, this was part of the master plan that was approved by uh, Oregon City several months ago. Mm -hmm. So the build out of this shelled space was included in the master plan. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and back to the, the um, outdoor space, um, the um, State of Oregon requires that we have an outdoor space uh, for children to go out into. So part of it is going to be covered so that even in inclement weather or you know terrible weather, we'll still have a space that they can go outside, not when it's snowing or anything like that, but you know, just if there's a mist or a drizzle or whatever, we'll still have a covered space that kids can go out into. Thank you. Um, yeah. Kathy? Uh, I had a question. Is this a long-term facilities or is it an interim? Short-term. Short-term. Short it's all acute short care. Term. Seven it's days is the average day. Seven to eight days oh. is the average day. So it's really an assessment, treatment, stabilization. We work with the families around return or we work around other placement options if something longer term is needed. Oh, okay. um, it's so really where you want that intensive psychiatric eval. Resolution of yes. acute care. a healthy situation. Right. Okay. Um, not a question, more of a quick comment. As somebody with a degree in psychology, and I used to work at the juvenile court counselor, Donnelly Long, as well as McLaren. Boy, is there ever a critical need for people to work with, with small children before they get to that level. And I, I had, grew up with a younger sister who had it. So I'm really glad that something like this is going to be available. I don't know if there's other ones in Clackamas County, but to know that it's going to be available in Oregon City because there's so many parents yeah. who need some place to turn to for those kind of services. So. And yeah, we totally agree. And actually, this is the only acute care facility for children under 10 years old. Yeah. Um, and so we're glad to be able to do that and actually glad we're able to build it out with state-of-the-art opportunities for really helping these children get off on the right foot. So what we saw in the juvenile detention centers, most part of us kids who didn't get help when they were younger, it's too late. By that exactly. time, they're teenagers. They've turned elsewhere. Exactly. Let's figure it so, out early so yeah, that we can exactly. do what we need to do. So, uh, so our schedule right now is, is that we will um, um, be done probably September of 2013. Okay. Um, we've already been into the state of Oregon for review, and then we'll, we've already been in contact with Oregon City to go in for our first review. Um, but we will have a, a community open house so that the community can come in and see. Um, what we've built there, and I think people will be pretty. Could we arrange to have a few people kept there? Just kidding, uh, Steve. You probably answered the question, and I have. Are there other facilities like this in the metro area? There's one other facility for adolescents, and that's at Legacy Emanuel. Um, and that, that is it. And then down in Eugene, there is another facility that has a small number for adolescents. Um, and so there's very few adolescent door children centers in the state. It's actually a, a, a great need. Um, so this facility, is it about the same size as the other facilities? It actually increases the capacity because of the single rooms. And I think the size in terms of square footage is about 4,000-ish extra feet. Yeah. So it's about, and so we're growing the size in, in terms of being able to treat both more children and also have more capacity to do more programming with them. The the children, <coughs> children's problems, you know, I mean, the prop problematic. So you folks have studied, or you have knowledge of other facilities in the area and the problems that they undergo uh, right. in a clinical setting like this hospital setting. Right. And we have been providing similar services at Prop Portland in the metro area um, for 30 years. years. Well, 14 years yeah. in Prop Portland. Prop Portland. 30 years in total, I think, between St. Vincent's and Prop Portland. 
So we're and we have some incredible doctors. I'm I'm real proud of the team. Would you be bringing new employees in or existing employees? There'll be new employees coming from Prop Portland, possibly, uh, as well as the psychiatrist will probably be commuting to this area. So there'll be new employees in that regard. I don't think, um, I don't know the number at this point, because we'll wait to see the, how many make the transition. Thank you. William. And although I'm sure that you are uh, working in concert with the uh, Clackamas Children's Center, I'm just wondering if you have some sort of a formal relationship with them. We haven't negotiated any formal relationships. We've talked with them. We'll also be talking with Morris Center and other children's care centers, uh, actually, because with this new capacity, we're hoping to have most of the uh, admissions be re direct admissions, which is much well, smoother for the children. With our Clackamas Center so yes, close. It exactly. Seems like and a actually, we have, fit. Yeah, we have a great relationship with Clackamas County Mental Health in general, so we're looking forward to just making great. that better. So the Clackamas Center, isn't that more from abused children? Or am I incorrect, or is that also well, mental? It's He's right. Some of those children yeah. will have psychiatric issues. As a result of that? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. If that's the end of questions, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Next up. <laughs> Alita and friends. <laughs> oh, yeah, that means John. Thank you very much for coming in. That's why you wore a tie. Uh, he's trying to impress people right now. Yeah, that's right. You'll have to exit out of escape. Oh, and before this begins, we have uh, two new arrivals of the other on the record as being. Okay. Yeah. So I don't recall if we got, I think we actually asked to be at this meeting, but we assume you would have invited us anyway had you known we wanted to talk. So thank you for inviting us. How's that? We, when we invite you, we only give you five minutes. When we ask <laughs> 15 minutes. No, that, that was something that we didn't, we didn't rehearse our timing, so we might want to move through this Did you fairly know well that the Providence Willamette moved right They did there. a really good job, yes. Thank um, you for two that. other people came in the room. William, who were they that came in that you wanted to record? Would our new arrivals please identify themselves? Bruce? Bruce Danielson, River, River Association. Yes, thank you. Bill Daniels from Boston Neighborhood Association. Thank you, gentlemen. He didn't recognize who you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so the title of our presentation is Oregon City, the Value of Water, a Water Rate Study, Rollback, and Financial Plan. I think we were having a little bit of a dilemma trying to figure out what we wanted to, what we wanted to share and how best to, to press it into 15 minutes. but. Um, this is really about an issue that's coming before the city uh, relatively shortly. It's, it's got something to do with our water rollback and our water rates and our master plans. So we're going to give you all bits and pieces of that information. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the issue that's before the city with regard, that we're calling a water rollback, but um, you're going to learn a little bit about that and get uh, hopefully get a little more familiar with that particular term. I'd like to acknowledge this is a project that Nancy started and um, was kind of in the middle of, and when she left, she passed the baton. Alita's taken on a big piece of this. Um, Eli DeBerry, who's in the back, is also a part of, part of our presentation. We'll call on him for a, a little bit. We might need the microphone when that comes up, so keep that in mind. So um, <coughs> really, uh, the water rollback is our key topic, but we also want to talk about the existing water system infrastructure. Um, 2012 water master plan is complete. That's this document here, and it's now available online. Um, it's the Bible. It's the water Bible that we tend to go by. So it talks about a lot of things um, that are of interest to you if you're interested in your drinking water program. So it talks about the future development. It talks about current, uh, current system, pressures, all kinds of details and interesting information. So that's available online. Uh, we've listed CIP and SDCs up there as well. I would say to a lesser degree we'll talk about those, but uh, they are part of the water rate study. Um, both of those topics are, are pretty key. The other um, key topic is the water rate study and the financial planning. So we're going to be talking about that and then we'll leave some time for questions. Okay, to give you a little background on the water rate rollback, um, the city charter in section 58 has uh, um, states upon passage of this amendment to the city charter 
what the city water rates shall be those in effect as of October 31 1994 the Commission may not increase water rates by more than 3% annually without a vote of the people the Commission may not declare any ordinance or resolution establishing water rates to be an emergency nor use any other means to prevent their referral to the voters so with that um, could you briefly explain yes. to some of those what, yes. how that came to be? So, so to give you the background <laughs> on on how that came, that amendment came up, um, about, in the early 1990s, uh, the city took steps to improve the water system, and um, to to accomplish that and to pay for those improvements, the city borrowed money and issued water revenue bonds. They also significantly raised water rates to pay for pay back the bonds. Now, the a citizen group um, got together, and in 1996, um, due to these um, raising of water rates, and and I don't have the specific um, percentages, but it it was significant, and they were called the People Against Rate Enhancement. And they um, qualified for a ballot measure, um, ballot measure 365. And in that ballot measure, um, that was rolling back the rates to October 31, 1994 rates. That ballot measure um, was voted on by the people and um, did pass. Um, to roll back water rates to the 1994 levels. In um, 1997, um, after this ballot measure um, passed, the bond companies um, sued the city to um, uh, relook at these um, this ballot measure that uh, came into effect because they're to pay back the bond companies, um, the city had um, entered into covenants with the bond companies um, to maintain and collect rates sufficient to pay for the cost of maintaining and operating the system, as well as paying back um, the bond debt. So that um, led to a lawsuit that the federal court then um, made a decision on in February of 1997 and um, the decision was that um, the bond covenants had to be met um, by the city so that meant um, rate collecting rates and maintaining rates that would sufficiently pay off those bonds that would be completely paid back um, within 20 years uh, which brings the date to October 15, 2014 when all the bonds are paid off so the, the water rate rollback can then become effective after the bonds are paid off, which is now um, the October 15th, 2014 date, 14th date. So that's how this um, water rate rollback um, came into being and um, will be effective in 2014. The, this so just so I clarify, sorry. so this vote of the people when they voted on it, on that measure, the judge said, sorry, the city still has to pay for it, but now because the citizens voted on it, now it reverts back to that as of that October? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, good. I didn't understand that before. Thanks. Yes. So, yes, uh, upon um, payment of, of the bonds, then, then. then the vote of the people, the rate rollback, can take the rates back to the 1994 levels with whatever 3% increases that um, took place during that time. Sorry to interrupt, I just needed to understand. So, um, is that, let me make sure that this is key. So, is this, do you need, do you want to explain in different terms or is it, everybody got it? Shake, kind of a did, shake of the hand. How did it's, the citizens take that when they knew they voted on it and it was going to be put off for 20 years? That, what they voted on did they, they didn't know it yeah. was going to be they, they, they didn't yeah they didn't yeah i don't oh. think they realized all the repercussions of this and uh, like i said they uh, the way it feels to me is rates were set at a high rate people were upset about it mm -hmm. and convinced that we should vote 
down so they amended our charter that was overturned because we had all this debt to pay off and um, so but but when they overturned it they also said well once it's paid off we want you to roll those rates all the way back you know there is some adjustments for for uh, increases three percent increase but we want you to roll those all the way back and uh, so that's where we're at today we're in a situation that was voted in you know almost 20 years ago and we realize that that has serious repercussions for the city's water rates, and we want to present more of that for you as well. Do so. I know if you have any idea what the uh, mix was of voting for or against? Was it? A, I've not heard a that. Very strong citizen input. Fifty-fifty. I've not heard, but we can find that out for you. It would be interesting to know where the citizens were at, you know, fifteen years ago. My recollection when I went to the meetings and where I met Bill Daniels and a few other people, Dan Holiday. Yes, it was very contentious. Okay. Sorry, I'll let you continue. Okay. Just wanted to clarify for the mm -hmm. people it, watching home yes. at home. Mm -hmm. Did you get your answer? So it's going to be 3%. It'll be what it was in 94 and then 3% every year. Uh, there is some discussion about that uh, from our attorneys are looking at that. So, uh, for the most part, 3% a year. Um, there was a couple of years that 3% didn't occur. And there's some question about whether or not you know we could still apply the three percent to get our 2014 rate or f 15 there, rate, but yeah, essentially three percent. Within the uh, presentation, there's three scenarios that they that they have come up with, and uh, uh, financial scenarios, and uh, that will help explain okay. uh, the different options. Right. We're we're going to show the current, and we're going to show one scenario. We're not going to show all of them. Because that's part of the rate analysis work that we're kind of under underway right now. Okay. So. Proceed. <coughs> so, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with our our water system, we have a, a complicated system. We've got uh, five reservoirs with over 18 million gallons of, of treated water storage. Some of you might be familiar with them. Barlow Crest is, is an above ground reservoir. Um, up in the Park Place neighborhood. Boynton is shown in the picture. It's, uh, I can't remember, the it's South End and another neighborhood, I don't Tower recall. Crest. Tower Crest. Um, Henrici is outside the city limits. Um, and Mountain View 1 and 2 are uh, behind the grocery outlet store. So that's where those are at. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to note was Boynton and Henrici. Uh, still need seismic upgrades, and that they they do show up as part of our capital improvement program. We also have 154 miles of pipe. That number doesn't include all the service lines. So from the street pipeline out to your property line, there's additional footage there. But we're going to talk a little bit more about service life of that 150 miles. We've got uh, four pump stations. One of them's fairly small, but uh, four, 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 three sizable pump stations. Several pressure pressure reducing valves. Um, water quality regulations that uh, sometimes seem overwhelming, but um, if you've read your uh, annual water quality report, you'll see a lot of that uh, information is there um, that, that we're obligated to kind of meet. Uh, 10,000 meters and our water source, uh, the Clackamas River, and we get our water from South Fork Water Board, which is jointly owned between the city of Westland and, and Oregon City, so good, good strong wa water source. So as I mentioned, we just completed the uh, 2012 water master plan. We try to do this master plan update at least every five years. It helps us forecast the future with regard to future growth. I, I want to stress that water rates typically are not paid by, um, uh, do not contribute to, to future growth. Future growth in Oregon City for water is paid for by future growth. That's the, so we're talking today about rates and water rates, which is uh, operation, replacement of our existing system, upgrades to our existing system, some of which might benefit um, new growth, but uh, in, in this analysis, we look, we look as hard as we can to try and split that out. So new growth would pay for itself through SDCs or through private development. Uh, the existing system is paid for through your rates, okay? Um, Again, there's this figure at the bottom, annual pipeline replacement costs of 2.3 million. That's kind of a theoretical number. We think it's 
we're, we're going to show that number, but the more we look at that number, the more we question that. And that's also part of the rate analysis that we're looking at. So there's more to come on this. And by the way, this is our first presentation for the for this topic. Nancy's done a couple to the city commission. Maybe she did it to the CAC. I'm not recalling that, but is that is that right? Uh, we're we're going to do it at least one more time for the CAC. Is that correct? After we've got a few a little bit more information. Do you think that number is high or low? I think that number is low. Okay. So the next slide is about water demand. I don't want to spend too much time on this slide because we're running out of time. But um, basically, we're, we're we're showing you the existing and the build out. So anything above the blue line on any of these slides, uh, you know, would essentially be covered through SDCs or or development itself, paying for those kind of improvements. Slide. This is the one that I kind of wanted to spend some time with, so bear with me here. So we're calling this preliminary revenue and operating expense forecast. So um, just to describe the graph, the bottom scale is all about a year. Uh, each year we're showing some past years and really the future years. Uh, millions of dollars on the vertical scale. The blue represents revenue that we project to get, and this is based on our, our current rate with the 3% increase, and then w what you see in year 15-16 is a drop off in revenue. So if you focus on the blue lines first, let's talk through those. So the first four years that are shown on here assumes, um, first of all, it assumes some 3% in terms of, of consumption. That's Debatable. If it's anything like gas, you see gas uh, consumption kind of dropping off on a per capita basis. This assumes growth of 3% on the revenue, which means we're going to sell that much more water. In 2015, uh, the, we're, we're showing the rollback and what its effects are. So, And then from that point forward, you see, again, similar kind of 3% growth. That's on the revenue side. On the operating expense side, again, we're also showing our um, current costs and we're projecting that at 3%. The difference between the 14 and 15, you actually see the 15, 16 operating expenses drop just a little bit. That represents the um, fact that the bonds have been paid off, so we won't be making that debt service payment anymore. And then from that fo point forward, we see we're showing those operating costs continuing to climb at 3%. The big problem, obviously, is uh, twofold, I see. In the first few lines, um, we're showing about a little less than a So the difference in 2011-12, so the first two bars, you're seeing about a little bit less than a million dollars difference. That was our capital program, and that's been, that kind of is continuing to be our capital program. So that 2.3 million that we were showing earlier is showing up here as really just one million. So we're, we're underspending right now in capital needs. Okay, so then as you progress over to 15, 16, you see that the revenue is under the operating expense. So not only do we not have a capital, but we don't have enough funding to cover operating expenditures. So these numbers came out of our master plan and were presented. Paul, this is one of the slides that you might remember. So they've been presented. We're looking hard at these numbers using um, a firm that, and some, our, some of our own analysis uh, to kind of really um, confirm these numbers. So more to come on that. So we're going to ask Eli to do a quickie okay. on, on this information. You want to come on up, Eli? Carry them up. Basically, I'll go ahead and talk through this a little bit. Pipe, uh, so that 2.3 million kind of boils down to how many miles of pipe we had. We said 154 miles. And if we give those pipelines an average life of 75 years, we should be replacing two miles of pipe per year. That kind of works if you have pipelines that are relatively young or say 25 years or less. We've got a lot of pipelines that are older than that. That's why I think that $2.3 million uh, in annual replacement costs might be a little low. 
So that's something we're going to look hard at, and we're going to try and confirm. So you have a question? I have a question on the previous graph. For the next four years, you show a surplus. Now, have you had that surplus for the last 20 years? The first four years shows a surplus, but what what I was talking I about. I understand that, but I'm okay. saying prior to that, you've been paying off band bonds for I guess 17 years now or 16 years. Have you shown a surplus for the previous years? Right. So the the, sure. be, the best I can say is we've had a capital program for several years. So beyond what we're paying in uh, operating costs, the operating expenses. Whatever's left, we've spent on capital improvements, so pipeline replacements, oh, so uh, you, you, you pump station. The surplus that that graph shows has been spent on on capital. capital. Improvements. Okay, yes. that's yep. 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 And parties. Parties. <laughs> okay. So um, really, what we kind of wanted Eli to talk a little bit about was just some of the things that we've got on the cart here. So. So these are the capital uh, improvements. This is the old. This is the new. This is cast iron here. If you took a sledgehammer and hit this, it'd break like an eggshell. The cast iron, or the ductile iron, if you did that, I could hit it all day long and it wouldn't break. So it's, it, it'll last a lot longer. But uh, we're seeing a lot of this type of pipe. I'm, I'm not going to pick them up and show them. In the yeah. stuff, but you're, you're welcome to see it uh, later on. But uh, a lot of this is in the old part of town um, that, that we have been replacing some mains with the ductile. Uh, I want to show you a couple of these uh, service lines. This is a galvanized pipe. We had a leak connected to the meter. And I don't know if you can see inside that thing, but it kind of looks like my arteries. It's kind of <laughs> getting. And then this one here is over at Warner Milne, uh, across from the old city hall. Um, it's a two inch galvanized pipe. So they definitely need to be replaced. And we've got plenty of this that has to be replaced. Um, meters, too. We we found this meter couldn't get to the angle stop because there's a rip growing around it. So these need to be replaced too as well. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time. So Could, I ask, yeah. Yeah. Could yeah. So, I ask him a question? Uh, Are you doing this in-house work? I mean, you're not hiring it out? We're doing both. We've got uh, some contractors doing some of the water lines. The, these two actually came from the Brighton project that we're doing now, Ogden and Brighton. Um, so we, we do some in-house water main replacements when we can, and, and then we have some contracted ones too. But there are, everything they're doing or have been doing for the last few years has been with the better, longer-lasting pipe? It right. is. So, yes, yes. Okay. You. Can you bring those and oh. carry them around the room? <laughs> <laughs> I'll wheel it around. <laughs> I know we're, Steve. I know we're ex Steve has a question right behind you here. Yeah. Um, so, with the average life of 75 years, is that the old stuff or the new stuff? The old stuff is probably, I'd say around 75, the cast iron will last that long. I mean, well, it's, we're, gonna, we're trying to let, make it last as long as we can. This ductile, it should go at least 80. If it's, we, we have a flushing program and all that too, so, so it should. Um, strengthen the life of the pipe and whatnot. So. The cast iron is that where lead comes from versus the other? Or I don't no, know. no. I just, no. You just hear about lead. And Your brain damage comes from. <laughs> but but yeah. that, uh, if there's you know for the most part we have no uh, pipelines that uh, have any lead components. It just looked old and rusty. They're, yeah, it's old and rusty. But Do we have any wood left? Uh, no, I don't think we have any wood left. Or clay. I haven't yeah. seen yeah. it. That was surprising. We have, we have some of best of some amount of uh, light. Lizzie? Eli, Eli what's, what's, I have an idea, but what is ductile iron? Extruded as opposed to cast. Do you hear that? Yeah. What does that mean? Extruded. I don't think a lot of people may have known what the difference between that. But. Extruded. It's, it's just how you make it. What's that? It, extruded. It comes through a system and... and like spaghetti. Yeah, it's like so, wire. Yeah, it's okay. Whereas cast, I think, is just cast in a mold, molten steel and cast in a mold. Good question. But but the steel itself, it's, it's just it's iron, it's steel. It, is it coated with anything on the inside or There's outside? There's a cement line on the inside. Both actually have that cement line. So, but the old uh, cast iron actually, I had these pipes stored, and when I picked them up and put them on this uh, rack, all of this stuff came out of it too. So it's 
Looks like it comes through my water lines every once in a while. What's your question? Yeah, He's right here. Yeah, I didn't see the up. hands up, so oh, I'm sorry. No, but he, well, I, thought, I thought we were supposed to use the gravitas system and, and punch your buttons. Usually, we are, but they're in the middle of a presentation. Okay. Usually, we say yeah, them, but right. we've kind of interrupted them to I'm ask not. as we it's move okay. along. Okay, we don't mind if you don't mind. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so Don was next. Well, one, Kathy, there, there was a there was a place on the chart there uh, in uh, 2015 where uh, the cheaper water kicks in. I believe is that correct? That's correct. 2015. Right. Right. Cheaper water, what does that mean? Well, that means you're not going to have less volume. You're probably going to have more volume of, of cheaper water, right? Well, uh, we're not necessarily saying cheaper water. We're just saying we're going to collect less revenue. Well, I'm thinking volume of water, okay, because right, we're still going to have to provide. You can see, yeah, you still have to provide, right? But it's at a, it's a lower unit rate. Right. You get to, you pay less for it. With our complicated system, do we serve any other communities in the area with our water? They're wholesale customers. Like I said, we serve yeah. through our we wheeled through our pipelines. Although some of them are West Lynn, so West Lynn's pipelines and uh, Clackamas River water as well. So this gets me to my point. Do we have a revenue source here? <laughs> yeah, we get revenue from them. Yeah, but even more revenue because now we have cheaper water that we can. Not really, because it kind of goes the other way, right? Goes the other way. Yeah, yes. it goes the other okay. way. Well, that was my question. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I some, guess some of us live in Oregon City, and I'm on. We found out this summer we're on Clackamas yeah. River water. So you'd have, have, have to pay more. So it's like a wash. It's, yeah, it's intergovernment sure. agreement. Sure. When he said concrete is lining the new, the new stuff, isn't that collect the the particles and sediment? Sediment and stuff, and do the same thing in the rust and concrete because there's it's not it's not like having you know your plumbing has the plastic pipe so it's smooth right. and nothing's. So I guess I'll say this: it's it's the highest standard pipeline in water construction used in the industry today. What what we use, and yes, it's got you it's use, got a variety. But there are better products available. Well, across the state, it's it's but, right. So yeah, there's. You'd probably make them out of gold, I imagine. You know, kind oh, of look there's, different. There's but there's other kinds of products, and that's debatable. Kathy, you mentioned PVC pipe. We don't allow PVC no, pipe I, in our in our system. Um, harder to locate. They do it in the homes. So they that, do it in the homes. Yeah, so right. that when right. it goes out to the sewers and stuff, that it. Except for it seems like every time it's the junction, the water, the sewer, it, that's where the pipe coming into the home. Will catch all the debris and clog up. To me. Okay. Can we move forward? Or There's one a question more? in the back, really quick. Yes, sir. So from a layman's position, I'm curious why we don't. First of all, you can answer why we don't use PVC, and then secondly, is it possible to use PVC uh, as a lining inside? Please repeat the question because I'm so not the question is is why don't we use PVC pipes? And the other question is is it possible to have a PVC lined pipeline? I believe um, the there is an option for PVC lined pipeline out there. Don't know about agencies that are using it. There, I, I, for one, they don't bond well, so the service connections I'm not that familiar with, and I'm not the pipe expert, but I, I don't know of anybody that's using a PVC lined pipeline. In, yeah, at least in the I state of Oregon. Our pipe yeah. expert's going to talk. Has he probably to answer a little bit about the PVC in my uh, career? Uh, I've been at other water districts and we've had the PVC. And if you take a 20-foot length pipe and the thing just tears all the way the length of the whole pipe, it looks like a, an earthquake happened in that, in that cul-de-sac where they put it, um, that kind of scares the heck out of me. It, you know, it's supposed to be a brand new fancy type pipe and all that but its history isn't as as uh, durable as the, the ductile iron pipe we we have ductile iron pipe water mains and copper service lines um, we had PVC lines to the meters at other at other water districts and the same thing they would split or, or they have leaching of chemicals and whatnot there was just a lot of negative things that that I saw um, back then so I was kind of happy to come to this city and, and they had the copper service lines and the ductile, ductile iron. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's, as time goes on, there'll be better and better pipes and all that, but right, right now, I think for your money, you've got, you've got a good water system. So, all in all. Thank you. 
Okay. No questions. Go ahead. All right. So. Oops. Amy's got one. I'm sorry, Amy. If you look at the operating expense difference between 2014-15 um, and 15-16, you show a minuscule drop, but you're saying that's where the bonds pay off. So are you saying that the bonds don't take up a big part of the operating expense right now? Right. Um, uh, do, uh, do you remember the payoff lead on that? Uh, I think there were. I think it was like 150,000 a year, 125,000 a year for the the last few years or per year payment. So that's what the big hit is, that even though we're dropping back that far, it wasn't that much. Only about 15% of the total. It really was not that much. Right. Looking at your, your numbers here, it's about 15% of the total. That sounds high to me. I don't think it was even that high. I, but Based on the drop. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Um, this, so a um, couple things. Paul mentioned some of these scenarios. This is one of those scenarios. This is actually the scenario that shows the, the, uh, a rate at which we actually meet our uh, operating expenses and provide enough revenue to eventually get to that $2.3 million per year. So if you look at the top, of the, uh, just below the title of the slide, this shows a 3% annual increase through fiscal year 2014-15. 10% increase for fiscal year 15-16, 5% increase for 16-17 and 17-18, and 3% annual increase thereafter. This is a theoretical scenario. Again, they put uh, two or three of these scenarios into the master plan. We're going to look a lot harder at those uh, through our rate study to, you know, provide for you and everybody else um, what what we really believe to be the um, the recommendation, but we don't also don't think this is too far off. So a couple things that I wanted to point out: um, this graph, if you look at the revenue, shows no water rollback. Okay, so we're just showing a, an increasing um, revenue stream here without the water rate rollback. The um, the revenue is assuming the rate increases that I just mentioned. The yellow bar is really just kind of showing that $2.3 million in annual pipe replacement. So for you know past years and, and years up to 2014-15, again, we're really, only, we're really only spending a little less than a million dollars on pipe replacements. So we're still well underfunded with our capital. We really don't get close to that until 2021-22, and I'm not sure why the little bars are showing up the way they are, but um, <laughs> but the the intent was to show that additional 2.3 million. So um, if that 2.3 million dollars is low, then you know we'll see even more kind of difference or shortfall between revenue and and um, expenses. But this gets us pretty close. Okay, I love this slide. Let's see. Um, so this is another piece of information that we need to scrutinize. Alita and I, this came from previous presentations, and we haven't had a chance to kind of ground truth the, the numbers, so we want to continue to look at that. What we did do is put it in the order of um, highest to lowest dollar amount. Um, one, of, one of the other goals that we're looking at is r right now on your water bill, South Fork Water Board, they're the cost that we pay out is, and the, the portion of your water bill that's, that's allocated to South Fork Water Board is just shows up as one water rate. So you get one water bill or you get one uh, line item on your water bill that's for water. And um, what we'd like to do is break out so that you know which part of that's treatment, which component of that's treatment, and which component of that is distribution. So that's another little small component to this. Um, water rate study that we'll be looking at. Um, we pay franchise fees. The water uh, utility pays franchise fees just like you would accept from PGE or expect from Quest or any of those. We also pay our fair share to be in the public right-of-way. And uh, I th I'm finding that to be, you know, 
critical as we look at other uh, agencies that are wanting to be within our right of way. Um, the general fund, just so you know, uh, that's administration. That's that's things like uh, tra transfers from the fund into the from the waterfront into the general fund to help pay for uh, you know human resources, finance department, all those you know city manager's office, city recorder's office, all those uh, those staff as well. So that's, <coughs> those are all costs. And there's that 5.2 million that showed up pr on previous slides uh, that would be our uh, <coughs> annual operating expense. Uh, one of the issues here is, is a bifold build. And this is where they separate the Southwest Fork water completely there, so it's a separate entity And in the discussion of this. And then one of the other elements that could be discussed is, is the new capitalizational process of, of capitalizing some of the maintenance plan. So because interest rates are so low, you can actually put together a funding plan where you bond it and you and you can re, you can get a steady bill or pay rate much like what we're doing we've been paying for you know 20 years on the old bonds but right now interest rates are low and we can actually uh, compartmentalize the whole bill into a such a way where where we could potentially eliminate that large 10 percent increase and and get it to a point where everybody can see it Right now, it's so uh, lumped together. Lumped together, it makes it difficult for people to fully understand all of the ways that it could be uh, worked with uh, to to keep it so families can afford to buy. You know, water. It, all utilities are getting to be part of a nut that's getting hard for a lot of people to pay pay for, particularly if you're a lower income person. But we do have within the city special dispensational rates for lower income people. A lot of people don't know about it, but uh, there is a, a, an ability to go to uh, the rate department to the uh, here at City Hall and ask for one of these certificates. Now all you have to do is fill it out and it can have a major reduction if you're a, a low income family and, and it's our job to make sure that the low income families do know about their this ability. Uh, just quickly. Are the rates charged for individual households, the same residential, the same as for businesses, or do they get charged more? Somebody was asking about um, fees and there's a. I mean, we're consumption-based rate. I looked at rates earlier. The residential rate, um, I think, there's a different rate structure for businesses than there is for, you know, residential rates. Just like there's a different, slightly different rate for multifamily to single family. I don't recall how comparable the you know the, the uh, commercial rate is. Don't know to if it's higher or lower. Yeah, it's it's based on consumption, okay. and I don't think anybody's. Um, I, I my sense is they're equitable and okay. fair. Yeah. So this is something that we can just skip through. It's basically showing our wholesale. We we we're continuing to see uh, increase. I, I was trying to get a sense of this it looks to me like we're about four percent increase annually this is annual expenditure on our wholesale water so uh, take a look at that so let's see I'm gonna cover this one so comprehensive rate study and financial plan what do you do when you're in this kind of a predicament you hire an expert we've we've hired a FCS group which is financial consulting solutions group to look at our uh, our past work, the water master plan that was done by yet another consultant, and to look hard at uh, our water rates and what it really means. They do a lot of work for uh, other agencies. They've done a lot of work for us. They helped us through the um, street maintenance utility fee discussion, and they're helpful and they have a good way of putting these into terms that everybody understands. They'll be they'll be here with us next time as well. Um, we're looking for uh, sustainable rates, obviously, but yet something that keeps up with our needs. Um, this rate analysis or financial plan is going to look at what are appropriate reserves. How much capital should we pay for? Does that $2.3 million a year kind of meet our needs, or is it something less or something more? You know, how much should we, you know, have in, at the year end in our uh, water funds? What's a, what's a reasonable contingency? 
Um, and then water rate structure, how do we, how do we spread our funding um, in a way that, that, that fits the community's ability to pay and, all, and also still meets our performance goals? So we'll see, uh, you'll see a lot more on that. <coughs> our goal, uh, we've got three goals listed here, but in the dialogue, so I have this dialogue. We've, Galita's gonna talk a lot about our public involvement process, but uh, have a good dialogue with the, with the citizens. Get our city commission to uh, um, uh, adopt a financial plan and, and select a rate structure and then take that to the voters. We'd also like to take on that question that Paul raised or point that Paul made about trying to break out that water bill so it's a little more clear to the property owner or the rate payer what, you know, what they're really paying for. And so those are the main goals. And as we go into this, um, there's a big component of um, public outreach that um, needs to happen um, to provide the public with uh, our goals um, and the, the city commission's goals as far as um, setting rates to have a sustainable um, water system after this um, uh, amendment to for the water rate rollbacks. So the, we have um, Barney and Worth, uh, a public outreach consultant who is um, helping uh, support this um, public outreach by helping providing um, information material and tools um, that we'll be using to implement the communication plan. In the um, early stages of uh, of the public outreach between September and um, November, we're going to be doing a phone survey, um, finding out um, what the public knows about uh, their water system, if they know anything about the water rate rollback, um, what's important to them. Uh, we will be setting up meetings to meet like we are today um, as we get more information, um, providing the background um, and uh, where um, the FCS group is going with the water rate study and um, keeping everyone informed. We are, um, have formed a water rate advisory committee. Um, it's still open for any interested members. Uh, we will be meeting twice this month and then um, there's another slide that will talk about the schedule but um, they will be meeting uh, with the City Commission during some work sessions and um, learning about what the findings are from our water rate study and um, starting to strategize um, uh, what kind of structure um, should go forward with uh, for water rates. Basically, Barney Worth is going to hopefully tell the story in terms that people understand. We're not always that great at that. <laughs> we want to give you more detail than you really need sometimes. So, but also do that in a transparent way so that it's clear. Steve, I have a question. At this point, uh, what can we as neighborhood representatives or leaders, what can we do in our neighborhoods? I think you can start talking about the term water rate rollback. Um, and explain that that um, in our opinion that's uh, uh, taking a system that's in good working condition at a standard that's um, well maintained and has a potential to really cause some detriment to that system and it's based on you know <coughs> old, old thinking and uh, maybe uh, you know I don't know what was going on at the time but right now we know that those that, that rollback would be detrimental to our ability to maintain the system. The other thing is, if, like <coughs> Alita mentioned, if there's someone interested that has a strong interest and wants to s sit on our stakeholder committee, it is moving fairly quickly, so I'm not sure when your next meeting is, but uh, we, you know, that would be a, of an interest. And then so the other thing is to invite them to this meeting and the next time we're on the agenda, because um, we'd, we'd be happy to share it. We've got a website. Um, That's that going to be important. We're, we're directing people to. Think of anything else? 
Um, we will have um, fact sheets that we can we will be mailing out as well as providing to um, the different associations so that they can hand those out and post them. You have people that will come out to the neighborhood meetings. That's what I was going to ask. When yeah. is this decision going to be made? Is there time to come out to some of these neighborhoods? Some of you, maybe not with this full presentation, but right. when um, is the decision going to? I mean, will this? I mean, because we're missing our September meeting. Will this take place in a September commission meeting, or uh, you know, to get on the ballot if it's going to be a November well, look, one? There's, there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities oh, for right, more information sorry. for your neighborhood, and so. Um, am I talking about this? Well, one? I didn't do it. So well, it won't be until next May that the election actually takes right. place. So, so all of this is driven by the May, May 13th election. Okay, so and it's not November. So we're, we're hopeful that we can put together the work and the, uh, you know, the tools that uh, will con be convincing to at least our city commission that this should go before, this, before the people. Um, The, the May election date is a target date. We, uh, it's not set in stone, but that's what we're shooting for. And really, one of the things that, that you know we hear is that it's difficult to do it the second time around. If you miss it the first time around, it's more difficult to do it the second time around. So we want to hit that May election uh, feeling really confident about our ability to um, present something that uh, the, the people understand. What do you, what do you see as your big biggest obstacle in convincing the voters to approve something like this other than yeah <laughs> money I mean if you show them the facts of what you have here uh, obviously we're I in think tough it's getting them to time. take the time to try to understand the topic if, if people don't want to you know people are busy so trying to get them to understand the topic uh, it's a little easier uh, to vote on something when there's a huge project out there you know, if you're voting on sewer rates and you've got a lake interceptor pipeline that's, you know, unique in the nation and you need water rates to pay for that, it's pretty easy to do. But in our situation, we don't necessarily have a big pipe project. We've got a lot of little pipes. And um, so, you know, getting people to understand that's going to be a challenge. But um, I think in informing the public, uh, you know, they, they rec people typically recognize how the importance of water. Um, it's... I guess you agree, just kind of convincing them that. Key thing is, as you form. say, is communications and making it believable, <coughs> believable that people understand it, why. In our presentations they make, I, I have a suggestion. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we had a fellow from the water department come in presentation in regards to replacement. Replacement of the uh, waiting pool at River Crest Park. And they were going to put in a water feature. And the guy, gentleman, gets up and starts talking, and he says one of the decisions is whether we put a filtration system in or just pump water and let it run away. And he says, the city doesn't care what they do because we don't pay for our water. We get it free. And I think that was the biggest mistake he made because personally, when I turn on my sprinkler system every, every summer, I know it's going to cost me $100 a month to water my yard just what my rate goes up for three, three and a half months. And, and we voted that they should have a filtration system and recycle the water. And I think that's the way the city should look at it, that it's, even if they don't pay for the water, it's still a cost to the citizens. And I don't think they should be saying that we don't care because we don't pay for it. Just a word of advice. Well, thank you. I would, yeah, if I'd have been there, I probably would have. Razzled them on that as well because we do we do care. I mean, yeah. Don, I would, I would guess just from, uh, from my neighborhood association, people always want to know how's this going to affect my pocketbook. You know, okay, so they're going to roll back the water rates. Gee, that's good. How much am I going to save if you roll back the water? You know, is it is it worth my time to vote against my pocketbook in this? Are you prepared to answer that question? Not tonight, but we will be. <laughs> we okay. will be. Right. We want to look at this you know, the specific unit rate yeah. and uh, be able to provide that to both the uh, commercial customers I and the residents. I think that's the first thing, questions out of the box in my group. It's, it's almost easy. always, I mean, who wouldn't <coughs> want to pay less for, <laughs> you know, service? Um, but if you realize that it's a detriment, it's, uh, in, I think well, we've seen this with the street utility fee. People are willing to pay for good 
service. And um, you know, you may, they might not pay the full amount of what's really required, but they'll, you know. So. Right back here. I think another thing you might think about um, coming in on in about a week or two, we're going to start having our algae water that hits Oregon City about August. I don't know if everybody, every neighborhood has that, but I know that a lot of Oregon City, once you hit late August, the water tastes horrible. People start filtering it. So, and every time we call in, you you know, it's oh, that's just the way it is. You know, we you you send out the water. This is it's, it's acceptable. It meets all of the criteria, but it tastes horrible. So, if you're trying to convince people that we've got good water, I know a lot of Oregon City doesn't really think that we have good water come August. Good tip. Are we done? We've got uh, a question slide, but you've asked plenty, so maybe we're done. Okay. I was I was on the agenda to talk, but Tom. Oh, I didn't see it on here. I'm sorry, Tom. Okay. Tom would like to speak to you. Two items uh, relative to the street maintenance fee. I'm getting a lot of pushback in the neighborhood. People are are concerned at the amount of annual increase, and they're telling me it's got to stop. Okay, and I try to explain the situation and why we're doing it, and I'm not getting through to them. All they see is their bill, and that is jump, 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 bigger and bigger. All right, so that that rate increase I think has reached its there's one left maximum. I believe there's one left. Could be wrong. The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I had just interestingly enough read an article about three weeks ago. I will try to locate it again and forward it to you, John. It had to do with water pipe technology and some of the things that are being used in cities across the country currently uh, that are, as I understand it, and I'm no expert, significantly better than what we're putting in the ground today. So if we get better life and better performance, that'd be better. Uh, I like it. I think it's better. So it's worth knowing about Cutting it. Edge. Nothing else. Cutting edge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That went on longer than we had planned, but there was lots of questions and good presentation. Okay. Um, with that done, uh, we'll move into um, item number four, which is approval of minutes. I wouldn't think so. William? Thank you. Um, Got the minutes done early, of course, but it seems like we got an extra week somehow this month. Um, I hope you all have had a chance to uh, to take a look at the minutes, and hope we can get a motion to uh, to approve these. Uh, I move to approve. Good. Second. Steve and Paul. <coughs> okay. Uh, Take the roll call for vote. All those in favor of approving the moment, the minutes, the moments, <laughs> the minutes. <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. One. Okay. One abstention. Yep. Uh, Amy, thank you. Amy, excuse me. Okay. Thought they've been approved. Five. Old business. Number A, Larry, proposed changes to Clackamas Park. Proposed changes to Clackamas Park are, I chatted with Scott Archer, and it looks like we're on again. <laughs> and uh, it is going to go through the Parks and Recreation Committee, and hopefully it will be enacted this fall. Well, how's that? Okay. Good work. Great. So moving right along, B, reminder, September CIC meeting is canceled. I missed one meeting in two and a half years, and you all decided to cancel a meeting. I took the power, <laughs> took the power invested me and gave us the day off. <laughs> You're good. I bet they want you back more often. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, we move to new business. Um, a budget presentation by Katie. And that's this little form you've got handed out regarding your budgets. No, my computer went away. What did you do? All this stuff in the back when I'm done. Okay. 
Okay, really brief. I <laughs> would like to go over. Let's see the budget for this year. I met with the three board members and um, we discussed that it was a dollar seventy per household that that needed to be moved up to a dollar seventy three per household. And that amount was the 25,000 that the city provides divided by the 14,440 total households. And then we rounded it and you can see down here. So um, this is the most current up to date. It shows what each neighborhood, what amount they have and some have already started using it. So you can see um, Barkley Hills and Gaffney Lane, McLaughlin, and South End have already started using some of their budget for this year. Then it shows down here the remainder. And there is a little bit of uh, $18.80 cushion in case I make a mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know that won't happen. That will never happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I know there's been a little bit of talk um, from a couple different neighborhoods that uh, this amount for certain neighborhoods may not be enough. I know that um, the city provided this money to help with mailings and that sort of thing. If there are neighborhoods towards the end of the fiscal year that um, need to come to the CIC to see if there is any remaining money, I think that's what the board of the CIC decided they could come before the CIC and ask if there's any extra money that may be used for that neighborhood, which I don't believe that's what we did last year or in the past. So that's kind of something new this year that we wanted to share with everyone. Um, along with, I know a lot of neighborhoods are doing um, extra fundraising, garage sales, different things that they're doing for fundraising. We also wanted to encourage um, using the uh, website using your individual neighborhood uh, association website and um, if you don't already use it a lot to start using it more um, if you want to encourage people maybe a neighborhood I'm this is just a recommendation it's not something that we're requiring people to do each neighborhood can do whatever they want to do with their allotted amount of money um, but if you find that with your neighborhood say you have six meetings a year and you're trying to send out newsletters and a postcard per meeting or whatever and your budget isn't um, meeting that a suggestion may be to um, put a newsletter on your website and send out a little postcard reminding them of the date but then to on the postcard to have them view the newsletter that you've put on the website so this is the city website and if you go to uh, about city Oregon City sorry about Oregon City and the yeah. neighborhoods yeah. there is all sorts of information on here and each one of you has a website page and you can just click on that and do you automatically that guy send you my postcard and do you automatically go ahead and put it on the website for us I try to remember if you don't see it there please remind me that you sent me something that needs to also be placed on the yeah, um, website probably not because he just sent yeah, yours um, hasn't been, but I was just going to show it's actually South End just sent out a um, newsletter, and I want to say we just received it like this week or last week or something right. in the mail, and um, theirs is on there right here, August 12th wow. newsletter. I can get it. <laughs> um, so you can look it up online, you can print it off. But what I'm saying, I guess, is encourage your, um, you can do more encouraging of them to, you post more stuff on here and then encourage people to come and view more of it on here. Um, if you're running into a budget crunch, you don't have to, you can do both. You can send it out and have it on here. But it seems like a lot of people aren't using their websites as much as they probably could be and they're expecting the mailings and stuff to do all the work for them. Um, so the next item I wanted to go to, so each one of you should have a hard copy of this to take with you to your neighborhoods, um, as well as if you come to a point where you're not sure what your balance is, just email me and I can let you know what that is at the time. And then one more thing and then I'll take your question. It's just real quick. Um, the only other item I have to show is just the cost sheet because I wanted you all to see 
um, what the costs were for this year. So if you do a uh, fourth, just a small postcard, this is the cost. So the total cost per postcard is 35 cents. A half sheet postcard is 37 cents. And then the newsletters, and they go up from there. And I actually broke it down by neighborhood. Here's your um, household. It's supposed to say number of households instead of number of residency, because that's incorrect. Um, number of households times the 35 cents for like the Barkley Hills. If they did the postcard, that's how much they would owe. If they did the half sheet, if they did a newsletter, so on and, and if so you on. notice on the postcards versus the letters, the postage stays the same. It's mm -hmm. how you use wisely your dollars for postcards versus newsletters. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Any questions? Yeah, the one question I have, Katie, I would like to know if there is some way that a group email can be sent out to residents in a certain area uh, in order to keep them abreast of what's going on. And the reason I'm asking that question is we're facing a couple of situations this year in our neighborhood that uh, we really need to get more citizen involvement than what we currently have. And I don't know how the city's set up in terms of maybe having a, a group list that can just you know, put a message and send it out to however many people are in the neighborhood. Do you, do you know if we've got that something that can get us to do that? To give their addresses to a crew. Well, first, I'll let William answer if, if, if I can, If I can say how we did it in, uh, in McLaughlin Neighborhood Association when I was chair, we had, a, we had a mailing list of, I'm trying to remember, it was 80 or 100 names on there. But the trick is getting the people to give you their email addresses. <laughs> and then every time you send something out, you also have to give them the option to opt out of that as well and not to abuse that, but if you can get the neighbors to give you their email addresses, there's nothing that the city has. I'm, Each I'm, looking, I'm looking from a functionality standpoint at a city level. If, if I were to provide something to you a broadcasting uh, tool. That, and give you the most recent email listing, is there something within the city that uh, they, they can put that list together and just Sounds like a Katie. Not that I know of. We currently don't have a program like that. Okay. So um, we do currently on each one of your websites, we offer the option to um, be added to a, um, let's see, received neighborhood association notification. Um, so you can I've never seen who's on that list though. That's, okay. That's and and you, can, I have. You, you can ask me and I'll email you what I have so far. Okay. Um, most of the lists are very short. Okay. Um, and they were given to me by Chris and it's whoever clicks on this link and submits information. I receive that and I add them to whichever neighborhood they choose to. And at this point, the only thing that I use that for is just to remind them of their upcoming um, neighborhood association uh, meeting. But if you guys would choose to use that for some other reason, um, like additional, like let's say you want to do an e-newsletter or something like that versus a mail one. That was, that was kind of where I was going. That's yes. up to you guys. I can provide that list to you and you guys can send that out. Okay. Yeah. Where I was going with that was if, if we can encourage people to go to the website and sign on there, then you're capturing their email address when they do that. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And so then those email addresses are available for sending out meeting notice or any other critical information. Right. Okay. Not as like a bulk. I don't have a system, though, that it just bulk sends out an email. I we have should. to hand enter those in and stuff, just like you would. So, yeah. But, we yeah, that we keep a, a distribution list. Yeah. But at this moment, for submitting neighborhood information, only the chair people or the steering committee can submit. Can any... Citizen, now my understanding was anybody could submit. Anybody can submit on this link. Submit neighborhood information. You mean this bottom link right here that I'm pointing to? Yes. That one? Yeah, anybody can submit information. But they right. can't what change it? your newsletters, your bylaws, anything like that. That's as far it. as I know, I have no. not received any um, well, I had, I had submissions. David, he would put some of the minutes in for me before you and Chris were taking over. They, he would put it in or in, in on the uh, website. Yeah. I mean, I'm not knowing what somebody would do, but if they did, does it have to be verified that it should be put on, that it's correct, whatever's being put in? 
if they submit something through this uh, submit neighborhood information, it doesn't go necessarily go on your website. What that does will go back to the neighborhood. The information that they submit will go back to the neighborhood, and the neighborhood decides maybe if they want to put it on their next agenda to have it be a topic to discuss in their neighborhood meeting or whatever it may be. Yeah, because it seems like somebody had sent me an email once about that. It probably depends on the information that they submit. Yeah. Amy okay. has a question. <laughs> Good job with the microphone. Um, is there a way to take advantage of using the adding something to a water bill, say, if you're, you know, you're paying postage, individual postage, but sometimes when a whole city thing comes up, they're able to slip a little thing in the water bill. Is there a way to do that for maybe a neighborhood area or? when they do the mail sort? That's something I'll have to check into. I don't have an answer for it that, would. but I can definitely get back to you on that. Well, they're normally money. booked for a year in advance. Yeah, the, yeah, and the Water Bureau may not have it broken down by neighborhoods just by addresses and locations, but yeah. I just wonder, because sometimes you get stuff for the city. But it would be cost effective yeah. doing that. Okay, and I see Bruce back there, Katie. <laughs> Part of 351 homes in the CIC neighborhood. What do you say? The downtown. <coughs> the downtown areas. That's the that comes down. That's that's It's on the map. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> <laughs> all those homeless people. One. <laughs> Katie, are you done? They, One. They're all going to Michael's 505. Yeah. Right. <laughs> One thing that came up, oh, just a second, Steve, is the fact that a lot of neighborhoods have run out of funds at different times, and they're wondering how they used it as, as an example. I got a call. Why did Park Place get to put out a big newsletter all the time? Well, we only do three newsletters a year um, because we kind of tell everybody in advance what to plan. We don't figure we need to do it every other month. But I'm going to let Steve talk about that because okay. I see his, his hands up. But it can be cost feasible when you look at it. what it is. It's only 22 cents for 11 by 17 single versus, you know, the 14 cents for 8.5 by 11 just a flyer. So a few cents more and a few less each year, you get the word out. Steve? Yeah. So that was the only thing that we did was with only three general meetings, we only needed three newsletters. So decided to budget that way. Um, question regarding the cost sheet, do you have it electronically that you can distribute? I do, yeah. Okay. What? <laughs> so he can send it out to his <laughs> email list. <laughs> so that the neighbors so that can see can read it of course. and appreciate it. Of course. Okay. All right, continuing, you, continuing on with new business, I have a couple items I wanted to bring up. One was last Wednesday at the uh, uh, City Commission meeting. Um, we know that uh, it's been approved to go to the ballot, an initiative on the right to vote on urban renewal funds. And uh, we know that how we know in all these elections how so much information, misinformation gets out there. So I propose that the CIC be a sponsor of a, not necessarily a debate, I use that term, but a, a, a like forum. we did a forum. Um, and I, I've already contacted uh, Clackamas Community College to ask for some professional guidance of the debate coaches and judges up there as to how to set something like that up. Because I, what I was foreseeing is it's not going to be a debate where somebody wins. It's more of three, pe three or four people that um, one side chooses to speak for them and three or four for the other side. And, and we have a good dialogue with the audience, and the audience can ask them questions and vice versa. But that all depends on what Clackamas Community College, the experts up there, tell us. And if that's approved by all of you, I mean, um, we'll start looking into a location. Maybe Clackamas Community College will use it as an education tool for some of their students. But if you like that idea, William. Uh, yeah, and, and we've done, there's precedent for that and the fact that we've we've had uh, candidate debates before, so this right. would be something along those lines. Exactly. Uh, you should be aware that, uh, as, as I understand it, the mayor has uh, requested the Chamber of Commerce to go in on that okay. as well for, so that there could be a citywide forum, but I know that the uh, the mayor is trying to instigate something as well, so rather than step on each other's feet, maybe we can coordinate the whole thing into uh, okay. one major... Because uh, last week when I mentioned it to him, he didn't say anything about that. He just, I said... I'd he probably just stole your idea and... Fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take his gap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will contact Doug and we will look into uh, that. Uh, again, I, my initial one was because 
I don't want any of us to be in the center, but I thought some people, professional people from like Clackamas mm -hmm. Community College. Mm -hmm. I also understand that we don't know yet who's going to be, uh, who or how many might be running for office, so I, those were going to be two separate things probably in this city. That, that just the issue itself of urban renewal funds may take a whole good evening of debate. So having one second, Steve. So having uh, one for the candidates also that's separate, like we've done in the past, mm -hmm. would take place. Steve. So the only issue that I see is we don't have a meeting in September, which right. would be the time frame that we need to establish. Because it would be late September, October. So. Okay. So we would not set it, but what we would do is once I talk with Doug and tell him what I've done, we would email out everyone, this is what we're doing, because we're not setting it, the CIC, we're just helping to host it and put it on with Doug. Well, and if you have it before, our, like we have a meeting September 20th, we can announce it, or could they put... So, it uh, all depends on my could conversation Could they put a notice in the water bill yeah. that this is meeting will... Well, again, that's probably it, already taken for that month. But if okay. we were, I was uh, talking to Clackamas Community College, and again, I'll talk to Doug. But if the vote's in November, any time in early no October gives them enough time. It does not have to be in September. So if our first meeting in October is such and such a date... But in the meantime, once this gets set up with Doug and whatever we're doing, we'll make sure you're all emailed out through Katie so you know what's happening. Mr. Chair, could I make a suggestion? Sure. Could I encourage you to uh, create a subcommittee so that you don't have to do all this by yourself and get two or three people together that could, uh, that could uh, bounce ideas off? What do you see them doing at this point until we know what's going to be happening? Well, rather than you having to be the sole contact with the college, the well, they, they're not going to call two or three different people. I mean, I'm no, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying that, for example, you didn't realize that the mayor had been doing something yeah, that. Yeah, because he didn't say anything. Yeah, <laughs> all the nerve. So, if, 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 are you are you then expecting to do this all by yourself, or do you want two or three? I people don't have there? a problem with him doing it. It wasn't so much that I was. I, I, <laughs> hey. I, it wasn't so much that I was trying to create a whole new subcommittee. Yeah. I think Tom can do it just fine. I, yeah. I think I'm, so too. Right now, I'm just getting the information, and then I was going to yeah. bring it back, and we. Can be fair about. I'm not sure what the subcommittee would do, <laughs> other than. We're, we're getting somebody that Doug and I, are, uh, any of us would agree Let on. us right. know if you need help. Yeah, there that's what go. I'm there looking at. Because right now it's just too many hands in there and too many things, because now all of a sudden Doug's involved. In I there. trust Doug and Tom to make it happen. Uh, t uh, Tom, trust me, not if Doug, I could, for one second. We, we have a problem, and a lot of people don't realize it, but it, it may be get brought up that uh, at the last uh, mm -hmm. uh, city commission meeting, some statements were made that officially could be considered uh, electioneering by people that are sitting on the city commission. And this is really dangerous, uh, and there is uh, significant legal precedence in the Ethics Commission on that. And uh, some of the statements and even the votes that were taken uh, put si sitting s city commissioners and mayor into a position of being adjudicated by the state ethics board for electioneering. And so this is really very difficult. So this need to have something like what the CIC can do is really critical for the city and for those elected because of uh, uh, current laws and regulations associated with electioneering of, an ex of a sitting uh, election official on uh, revenue issues. Uh, that uh, And so it, it fits the this thing 100 percent and some unfortunate uh, statements were made that put existing city people really in jeopardy. I don't know that anything's going to happen about it, but we need to be cognizant of the fact to make sure that we protect them from themselves. Okay. Well, Paul, I'm not sure. I appreciate that. I'm not sure what that has to do with what we're doing with the Well, city. It, That's we're protecting issue. them by, but, by um, doing something outside of in relation to what William was saying, I totally understand what, what William was thinking. Right now, I'm just getting what can we do, how can we do it, where can we do it, and then I'm going to ask for some people to help conduct it. It's right now, I'm just being kind of a source of, okay, how do we set this up? Can we do it? And then letting some of you know and then see through an email who wants to be a part of this to help do it. Much like we did with the earthquake uh, forums and the slides, uh, those kind of things, just uh, more informational than anything else and give everyone an opportunity to, to hear both sides right and, and question each other if need be. So, But that's up to how the professionals and the professors know how to do something like that. 
Does that meet with everyone's approval? So, Tom, the, the only other thing I want to add to that is both those other forums I know Public Works was heavily mm -hmm. involved with, and so I was kind of liking the idea of uh, the community college participating in that. But if we were expected to participate, then we need to you know. We need department. to know early. Yeah, that's why I'm looking. I looked into it the very next day. Um, okay. I, I've got emails. I've talked to somebody up there already. Okay. Not okay. about. Not, it's not what I want. Not what anybody else wants. It's what they think is the best way to do it. Seen this. Okay. The other thing I, I wanted. Yes. Back there in the back. Keep working on it. If you need some help from the CIT, come on back. You got it. Oh, thank you. The other thing I wanted to bring up, and I'm not sure if anybody does this, but during my brief term as uh, chair in Park Place, I approached the mayor on this uh, thought, and he thought it was a good idea. And I said, well, some of our neighborhoods have, I mean, we have different recognitions to the Chamber of Commerce and other things, but sometimes you have standouts in your neighborhood associations who really do a great job. And Park Place, for since I've been there, we have a gentleman, Alan Bedore who cleans up Lower Park Place every day. You see him over there walking up and down off his bike and picking up paper and uh, standing there with a flag and saluting people. And I asked, Doug, couldn't, wouldn't it be nice if each neighborhood did something where we recognized a certain person in our neighborhood mm -hmm. as it was worth as the time came up? It doesn't have to be an annual, you know, you have to take a vote, but recognize some people. And I said, I'd love to be able to call Alan Mador. He ran for mayor once. Uh, mayor of uh, Lower Holcomb for for a, for a day or something like that, and Doug said, "Hey, that would be fine with me if you do something like that." But each of us in our neighborhood has something, so maybe I'm not sure if that's a committee for us. That's for each in individual neighborhood. You might think about something like that as a way to recognize. And Doug said, "I mean, we don't have to give them anything; just the recognition of saying their name and, and congratulating them. It makes them feel good that they're doing an effort." Steve, any comment? Yes. A proclamation. Yes. That's another Proclamation. Yes. Mayor of Lowell. Can, can Katie tag onto that because I think it's a natural segue into the uh, volunteer um, It is and isn't. I, I agree with what you're saying and maybe that does go within the neighborhood association. But to tag onto that since you are bringing it up, um, the volunteer um, recognition is coming up at the Great. concerts in the park, the appreciation. Um, it's going to be August 9th, and I have a flyer and a sticker for every single one August of you. August 9th? And then some. That yeah. quick? Yes. I was wondering why we didn't get anything in the mail this year. <laughs> we did. So I didn't. Take, oh, one, did. take one and pass it along. I'll give you two. I've been dropped from I all mail lists. One. I don't know um, mine. Oh, you sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you get my point. I think it would just be a nice gesture, and it's something not to be, we need to com create a committee, but you might start thinking about Steve. that for your neighborhoods. Okay. From that, let's move into, um, oh, we've already heard from John. We don't need to hear from him again. I want to hear from John. <laughs> John, John. Oh, he's got hand John, in his well, while, he's, while he's busy, um, maybe I can tack on, I don't know if it falls under old business or new business, but two things. One is the... Um, uh, the uh, farmers market, the CIC continues to have a booth there on the fourth Saturdays that uh, Larry and I have been staffing. And if anybody else wants to uh, to join us, they're more than welcome. We moved it to the fourth Saturdays because third Saturdays is yeah, okay. So, um, and secondly, is that uh, tomorrow night is the uh, national night out. Isn't it tomorrow night? Yes. Yes, yeah, yes. tomorrow night. Oh, I didn't mean to take your thunder. Yeah, that's all right. But I was just <laughs> biding time until... You get to uh, announce it. Too. <laughs> Let's hear from John. We're just announcing it. It's We're a team. That's all right. Yeah, it's, a, it's an action item, too. Okay. Oh, okay. John. Okay, so I guess I'll start. I have a few items, but I'll, since it's Ask OCPW, John Lewis, do you have questions? No questions? Don's got one. Uh, I understood that the, yeah, the bids for the Barclay Hills paving project, that's on. Now it is. I'll start again. Uh, I understand the bids for the paving stuff for Barclay Hills well, has, uh, right. that date's gone by, but I haven't heard anything about a starting date. Uh, do we know about that? Right. So uh, the it's actually not specific to Barclay Hills. It's our 2012 uh, pavement Improvement project. <coughs> Again, we which don't care about our streets, which includes Barclay Hills. <laughs> <laughs> There's several around the city. I just want to be clear about that. We try to spread that work around. Uh, we did bid. We, we did uh, bid that. I'm not going to remember the exact number, but it's about 1.8 million dollars. It was uh, about 350 thousand dollars more than what we had hoped 
Is that, that, is be that because of the uh, intersection adjustments that we talked about? Uh, well, that's part of it. That's part of it. Uh, we did we did add a significant component to Barkley Hills Avenue because we spoke to the neighborhood and the neighborhood um, spoke back. Press spoke back that's exactly, right. and so your neighborhoods do have, make a difference. Um, there's there's if you come up Barkley Hills to Malala, there's uh, about three or four feet of a curb extension right there, and uh, that really kind of prohibits two small vehicles from pulling up to the intersection, one that might want to make a left and one that may, might want to make a right. So we're going to modify that corner there, and there's a fair amount of expense that goes along with that. Um, but um, so what I brought today was um, our list. These are postcards that um, you may get in, if you're in the close vicinity to those, we didn't send them citywide, but uh, I'll go ahead and hand those out. They list the streets and the type of treatment and the from and the, the beginning point and the end point for that. And Barkley Hills is, is one of those streets. Um, Malala was on the list, but um, we took it off the list. And Malala from Holmes Lane all the way to Fur Street. So it was a big piece of Malala. And um, when we looked at some of the unit pricing and the fact that we the prices came in a little higher than what we had hoped for, we thought Let's delay that piece of work. Um, we're going to be pressing up against the winter weather anyway with this contract. And so we talked to the contractor about it and said, can we hold this piece back to kind of see how our funding plays out? It's a little early in the year to be overcommitted, uh, a little early in the budget year to be overcommitted. So we're planning to pull that, that work back and uh, take a second to look at it uh, early next year. Um, with regard to schedule, Don, we did meet with the contractor. Uh, we met with him mostly about this topic about elimination of Malala Avenue from the contract. Yeah, but we also talked to him about his schedule and the fact that we needed him in here. He's talking mid-August. Um, okay. Let me think about that for just a minute. Mid-August. That's not very far. That's not very far out. So mid-September for start date. So, okay. um, sorry. So that's that project. That was one that I wanted to talk about. The other one was the uh, slurry seals. We've completed our slurry seal project for 2012. I heard about a few hiccups with that, but for the most part, um, a lot of people were happy. Um, we got a lot of positive comments. So hopefully, if yeah, you had it happen, I can't. Well, across the street, the city. I'm not, but it was so much fun. It was a show and tell because I've never seen so many people, neighbors, walking up and down the street. And I finally, when it calmed down, because the guy said, well, there's not going to be much traffic going in there. And I said, there's 42 homes in there, you know, two cars. And a little later, I went out, and it was a hot day. And I said, are you having fun yet? And he said, no. <laughs> so, But it, they did a good job. I mean, they were in. They were out. But people kept trying to figure how to get in. But it's, they had a flagger on both ends to make it one way. And they came back, did the other end right away, and... Payson Farm was one, Parish Glen, and I think they did something in either Hazel Grove, one or two, or somewhere else. But yes, it was quite interesting. The neighbors were very inquisitive. You had a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of them got well informed. There was uh, one customer that I can think of that didn't, but uh, other than that, uh, we got pretty good notice, and so that, that seems to have been a success for 2012. And make, can I make a recommendation to anybody that's watching this? Don't have your garage sale that day. Because <laughs> <laughs> a woman did, and everybody would go by, and they was looking how to turn in to go there. So don't have your garage sale that day. That would be a problem. You have Barkley from Telford to Cherry, and it's a two-inch overlay. Now, what are you going to do? Do you do anything with, like, the spider webbing that's in it now? Because it is really broke up. Yeah, Barclay from um, Telford to Cherry. Telford to Cherry. You know, I'll have to. I've brought the plans with me. I'll have to go through that with you. But you're right. A lot of that is some of it we structurally dig out and patch back and then overlay. Um, but but some of it we're doing a thin mill and overlay. I don't remember exactly what we're doing for that section. Yeah, yeah. So it may just be a two inch overlay. Sometimes that's. I mean, we try to spread spread those dollars as far as we can. <laughs> we 
we there's there's only so much money to spread around. I, you know, the other thing I want to say about the utility fee is, if you remember, and, and we show this in our five-year plan, there's a page on there that shows the city's needs in terms of assuming all, you had all the funding in the world, what would that what would that picture of street work look like? And uh, it was pretty bleak. I mean, a lot of streets were covered. And that, this was a seven-year analysis. And so I can tell you that even at the, the higher rate that we have for uh, street utility fee, we're still missing the mark in a lot of, on a lot of streets. And we know that. Uh, we're doing the best we can to spread that money. Sometimes we're doing things a little differently than what we've done in the past and uh, with the hopes that that will still be a, a good fix. So I noticed that they're going to be doing up by, I call it arts, but a steel house down through the tunnel on the 99 that that's coming. I can't remember. Right they're doing yeah, it right they're, now. Yeah, okay. they're, I don't know what their schedule looks like, but uh, they milled it over the weekend, yeah. and I think they're paving it nights, and it's, you know, that's turning out that's really good. good. It's going to be great. I needed it really bad. and I haven't even paid attention. Did they restripe uh, through no, Kenema yet? No, not yet. Not yet? Just the temporary marks. Temporary marks. So, I mean, that that's all <coughs> hopefully going to be outstanding. You know, I guess the other piece is I think they come back and they do some work on the intersecting streets, but they're... They're trying to get all the mainline paved first. So, one thing I, I I wish that there were a representative from ODOT here tonight, but they had come before us, and I brought to their attention that the uh, lane at Parrot Creek, after they crossed the creek, going to South End, needed improvement so that you had some kind of a deceleration. They did that, even though it wasn't in their plans. So, you know, good, good. collisions are good going to be avoided. So. Well, if I have a chance, I'll pass that please, along. Please pass, pass that along and thank them. Uh, the other little update, uh, I think it was this group that asked a little bit about the Falls Lighting Project. So Singer Falls, there's a volunteer committee that applied for grant funding and got grant funding to uh, put lights back on the falls again. And so we've selected those. That's a that's a great group of people, by the way. Nick Dick and Dirkman, um, uh, Don Slack, uh, Dan Holliday. Um, the the uh, Rotary group they're just it's been fun to work with them and um, they've ordered the light packages so I hear from the distributor that that's coming probably first part of September and there's some installation work that's going to be done by a, a volunteer group of uh, electricians through the electricians union so it's 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 going to be an outstanding little project once it's lit. It's really going to be, uh, and hopefully it'll be in time for the, the Main Street, and or actually the Oregon City Westland Bridge opening. So. Since you brought up Singer Falls, is that water recirculated? Or is that free water to the city? <laughs> yeah, that's did, stormwater did, runoff. There. Was, was this, it's, maybe I'm out of my scope to ask, but did they... Um, did the city, was there any review boards for the type of lighting and, and how it would be? the lumens and the brightness and the details of it or is it just something that they were because it is city property right yeah no there was a small i would say uh involvement group that included those volunteers myself and this and at that time nancy crushar was there um did a good job we it. we did a sample yeah. lighting it was kind of you know and we had three vendors that came to show their their lights and we Kind of climbed up and down that that hill steeper than it looks. Uh, climbed up and down that trying to get those lit. Wasn't bad yeah. when I was twelve. <laughs> right, <laughs> right when you were twelve. So anyway, yeah, I, I would say we did have an oh. official, mm -hmm. um, unofficial lighting selection group, and um, I've been pretty involved with that as well. So, uh, John, we just have a new neighbor moving into Kanima, who is retiring as a, a full-time professor in graphic arts of New York has had a house, it's got the old Howard Clemson house. Oh. And uh, he's a specialist in, in, in lighting and graphic art and this type of world. And I brought it up to him and he said, uh, uh, he said there's a special team that's been involved in doing all lighting of all of the bridges in Multnomah County. And he said, uh, and I talked to him about the, uh, the team that's uh, the National Endowment of, of arts uh, grant we got for the elevator and he said boy uh, sure should be taking advantage of some of the professional graphics people and the people who've been doing these types of things so yeah we may have some citizens people 
but uh, it's sure nice to have uh, people with uh, with degrees in in this type of world helping us. We'd be happy to talk to them. Use yeah, them. use them. So send yeah. them our way, Paul. They're, they're, they're he's re he's a retired professor, so okay. Um, well, the Oregon City Westland Bridge, as far as I know, is still on track for uh, the uh, event, which is 12th, 13th, and 14th, and then the bridge would be open to traffic the morning of the 15th, so in October. Did I say the wrong month? I'm yep. sorry. Did okay. I understand That's the bicyclists are already around. using it? What's that? I understand the bicyclists are already using it. <laughs> I haven't heard that. They've only lost three off the edge. Yeah. John, it, it, when, when the arch bridge opens, is that the same time that the interstate bridge is going to go under construction? Then? <laughs> is that right? I haven't heard that. Really? That was a good one, Don. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't That's heard the way that. things happen around here. <laughs> Um, okay. And then, did you mention National Night Out? Yes. I was going to. Oh, you were. <laughs> there were several of us. No, but you go ahead. <laughs> no, I, uh, well, somebody better do it. And Probably somebody mentioned, uh, was it Paul that mentioned the Illuminate Oregon City? The, the Actually, Main Street Oregon City and the city as a co-applicant are receiving a $100,000 grant from the uh, Arts Endowment. And uh, there's money in there for painting of the elevator, prepping the elevator, getting it ready for some uh, unique light project that would, uh, I saw, I've seen some YouTube videos of that and it looks pretty impressive. So maybe we'll see that kind of interest in Oregon City as well. Very cool. But that's a Lloyd Purdy, um, I would say Eric Wargren from Public Works. I'm less involved in that one. Can we get West Lynn to contribute to that uh, since they're the ones who are going to see it? They're going to see it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Steve Anderson, could you announce National Night Out because you well, put a lot of work in it? That's going to be during Roundtable, I think. Let's no, I don't think so. Well, think it's not part of new business. It's part of Roundtable, uh -huh. really. John, can uh -huh. I ask you it's about the scheduling for the street sweepers? They okay. seem to come by in the very wee hours of the morning when there's a lot of st cars on the street, and so I just don't understand the thought process behind that. It seems more logical to do it when people are gone to work and the streets are more clear of cars and also people are awake and it's not going to wake them up so <laughs> harshly. So are you talking wee hours? Is, are we talking I 7 a.m., 7.30? No, I mean like 5 a.m. Really? Yeah. Our street sweeper. Yeah, you can hear them coming long before they ever get to your house. Okay. We have I'm one street sweeper operator and his shift is uh, 7 to 4.30, with the exception of one day a week, I believe, where he's sweeping downtown Main Street. So I'm going to have to look into that. Yes, so, would you please? Because yeah. I know my alarm goes off at 6 and it's before that. He might be working which, overtime. Which neighborhood? I'm on High Street and South 2nd. Okay, okay. High Street and South 2nd is because of kind of where you're at. And oh, <laughs> <laughs> because of the vicinity, well, because of the vicinity of where your, you know, where our shop is and where you're at, yeah. um, it's quite possible that um, you're in the bowl. you're 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 in an area that he's on his way to Main Street or on his way to downtown, and he's just picking that up on his way. So I'll have to find out about that. But the good news is, the good news, the positive message here is, is that it happens often, right? <laughs> Because <laughs> we have we have we, uh, we have definitely increased the frequencies of our street sweeper. Whereas uh, you know it used to happen, um, I don't know, four times a year. We're close to ten times a year circulating the entire city, and we have just installed a uh, tracking device that we're hoping to be able to. A provide to the public so they can actually sit there at their computers and there's a breadcrumb trail that he leaves and you can actually find out where the sweeper is. So that's that's new innovation coming to you from Oregon City Public Works. And I think there is. Can we get a schedule of when it's going to be on what streets? No, you can't. That's too much effort. Uh, we're trying to avoid garbage days. So if if your sweeper is in your if the sweeper is in your neighborhood on a garbage day, uh, you call in and say this shouldn't be happening, and our sweeper operator should know that now. We've we've gone over that a lot, but other than that, it's too much to control between days off, 
between various obstructions, between <laughs> the sweeper operators also on the street crew. So some days when we're doing milling and paving or other things that we need, we pull them off that. So it's just too challenging to kind of hit it on any particular schedule. So I mean, yeah, what, one, one thing that we do do is we, ne we have routes now, so I'd have to check with my street supervisor to find out if it's that predictable to get from one route, you know, that you would know, well, if he did Route 6 yesterday, he's going to do Route 7 tomorrow. I'm not, not sure, but it's, you, you, I don't know, that's just a challenge that we're not, we're not ready to take on, but we do like the breadcrumb option, and we do like the fact that we've increased our frequency significantly. The only reason I ask is because I have a sister who lived in Long Beach, and Tuesday morning you did not park on the left side of the street, and Thursday morning you did not park on the right side of the street, and that would solve the problem of when the street sweeper goes yeah, by. California? Yeah, if we had that kind of funding, and uh, we've got, like I said, one street sweeper operator. We have two street sweepers, but um, and we do use both sweepers during the lease season, but generally we're running one street sweeper and you know when he's got a vacation day we may or may not fill that sweeper with another body depending on workloads it's just you know it's just kind of a small town environment that we're in okay is that it? that's it okay um typically we save announcements of events to a round table of dates and upcoming events uh it didn't really fit under new business because that's cic actual business but uh Larry's kind of anxious to talk about National Night Out, so I'm going to let him go first, and then we'll go to committee reports. Steve, I'd like you to inform sure. us. I can put it in mine. Okay. No, now. 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 Oh, like now. <laughs> we're jump he, he wants so to jump ahead and talk. No, we're not to roundtable yet, but he wants to get that announcement in there. And, and Steve, the reason is you've put a lot of work into it. I respect that. There's, uh, there's quite a few people. Put this on. Yeah. Quite a few people are, are involved in putting on the annual National Night Out Against Crime. Um, it all kind of centers around the, the police department and, and those that uh, sit on the police uh, or the chief's advisory committee. Uh, but National Night Out is a way to bond or create a bond between the community and the police department's first responders, your community res resource people. And it's a really, really fun event. It just happens to be tomorrow evening. It just happens to be at Chapin Park. And it just happens to start around 6 p.m. Thanks, Tom. Uh, great uh, entertainment on a stage. Uh, um, be two, two separate artists. One is Ray Gordon uh, in her blues band. And uh, I believe the second one is a Kelly Tyler, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, both excellent artists. We also have community um, in, involvement groups that are going to be there. I believe uh, CIC is going to be there t okay. tomorrow evening. I need to talk about that. Okay, we well, can move. The, you can mention that in in your report there, William. Um, fun booths for the kids. Uh, if you get there early, the first 300 people, I believe, get free hot dogs and chips and stuff from uh, the Beaver Creek. Uh, if they have a Hawaiian shirt on. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> you get there's going to be raffle prizes, and yes, if you the, the, there's a Hawaiian theme to this whole thing tomorrow evening. So wear some sort of uh, uh, Hawaiian garb, a shirt, a coconut. Uh, uh, bra, grass skirt. I want to see Tom in a grass skirt. That'd be great. Um, anyway, there'll be raffle prizes that have been donated by great uh, people in the community. So anyway, be there. Um, as I said, get there early. Get yourself uh, a free hot dog. After the 300 have been given away, they, I think they go for a you know, minimal price. Uh, but the police demonstrations, the canine unit's going to be there. I think there's going to be a martial arts demonstration also. It's just a real fun event. Okay. Do you want to address the CIC portion of that if, before we if go? If I may, please, yes, yeah, since we're on the topic, um, that I, I have the booth and the table and, uh, and the maps, and I need to get that bag back from you. Will you bring that tomorrow night, Steve? 
because we use how that. Much, how much is it worth? We like use that, that at the, uh, <laughs> at, the uh, at the movie, <laughs> at the movie in the park. If you bring that, because I forgot we're going to need it tomorrow night also. Yeah, um, I saw that in the car. However, um, I'm going to have some other obligations that night, and I'd like to know if anyone here would like to step up and staff the CIC booth. Uh, Chris Wadsworth has promised me that she's moved us over into the shade near the stage. So if you want, uh, if someone would like to uh, to stop by and you don't have to be there the whole time, but just stop by the uh, the CIC booth, uh, that would be appreciated. Otherwise, it'll just be unstaffed for a while. Is that it then? Yeah. See, I'm waiting for names. Okay, let's get go back now to committee reports. Uh, a land use committee. No report? No report. Okay. A bylaws revision committee. And we do have something to report, finally. Pass these out that way and this way. Last, um, we worked uh, into the night last uh, Tuesday because we wanted to make sure, when I found out that we were not going to be here in September, I wanted to make sure that we got these into the attorney, city attorney, to give them a couple months to work on these. So I want to kind of tell you what I told the city council. Um, Obviously, we started this project about six months ago, and what I've told them is in the beginning, there was a simple generic template, as you're all aware of, that was created for all neighborhoods. Over time, and as better comprehension has occurred as to the operations in each neighborhood, some neighborhood associations have made changes to their bylaws to adapt to current situations, while some bylaws have just stayed the way they were. So about a year ago, it became apparent to the city commission and the city attorney that our current neighborhood bylaws contain some nebulous definitions and flaws that needed updating and better defining. In a decision document by the city attorney, he addressed the need for more clarity in the bylaws. We were directed by the city manager to address this concern and provide the city with an updated bylaws template. Therefore, a CIC subcommittee was formed by the approval of the CIC neighborhood representatives. The volunteers on that committee came from various neighborhoods, including Tom O'Brien, Kathy Hogan, Alice Watts, Michael Berman, our downtown representative, and myself. So we, get, we began that process over six months ago. The process involved reviewing all the current neighborhood association bylaws to discover similarities and differences. We then compared those to the initial template provided by the city. So this new bylaw template is the compilation of many neighborhood bylaws taking the best and most comprehensive approach from each. Not one neighborhood had a bigger influence than another. As a group, we put together an initial updated bylaws document. We then reviewed that multiple times, making additional changes as needed. We have now arrived at what we believe is the most thorough set of bylaws for a neighborhood association. In organizing these bylaws, we made every attempt to make the wording as legal but as readable to any citizen as possible. And first report from the city attorney, as he reviewed them last Wednesday night, he said they look really thorough and look really clean and wording, and he'll, he will be reading them and getting back to us. So we, some of the things, we clarified authorities and responsibilities of elected officers and steering committee members. We clarified neighborhood association assets and the responsibility of such. We clearly defined the roles of elected officers, listing all duties and responsibilities. We directed all neighborhood associations to provide agendas, minutes, and other important neighborhood decisions to the city CIC liaison for public record. We also clarified neighborhood association boundaries, membership, and voting rights of those members. We added a full article section on the election of officers. We expanded the accountability and grievances section to provide for neighborhood membership to address concerns regarding their officers. So we presented that with that in mind to the city that night. And, um, and I said I should note that these bylaws are not a reaction to any prior situations or politics, but are simply updating and addressing the rights and responsibilities for all citizen membership and their respective neighborhood associations. So with that, I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank our committee that worked on this, uh, uh, Tom and, and Mike and Alice and uh, Kathy. And thank you all for, for for the months of putting this together. So, uh, Tom, did you? I, I, my screen's not up. Okay. Go ahead, Tom. I guess you're up there. Yes. One of, one of the things that I would like to uh, ask for a little assistance on, and I'll I'll try to explain what went on. Uh, at one of our meetings, after spending about two and a half hours working on this project, uh, we were 
leaving the building where we were meeting and Tom got a emergency call just as we were leaving. Uh, in that emergency, he had to respond to a medical situation and somehow in the process forgot to lock the door. Well, I locked the door. You locked the door? Yeah. You forgot to turn the key in. Close it. No, it was closed. In any case, I forgot the key. The key did not get returned the way it should have. Mm -hmm. The building owner or operator, Clackamas County Authority, ended up having to change the locks for which they're billing Tom personally. How much is the amount? $127.50. $127.50. $127 I don't know if we've got any surplus funds in the CIC <laughs> budget, but I really think that as a CIC we ought to look at compensating for this loss. Uh, I'd make a motion that we, uh, that we do that. I second it. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've been very embarrassed about this. Good. Put your hand up. <laughs> very embarrassed. And then, and then I started getting collection calls. Are you going to pay this or not? And I go, oh, I can't right now. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's really nice. Well, the thing of it is they could have waited because he had the key. I and, told them I and, had it. And I gave said, it I to them. Right they they were in a big hurry. They didn't, they call didn't the wait. question. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, called a question to approve uh, William's um, uh, Tom's motion. Tom's. Who's William's, motion. Motion? William's motion. William's to, motion. That we, <laughs> and Kathy that we second. reimburse you. Not me, the Clackamas County. Second it. Yep. I already did. Okay. okay. All those in favor of approving that uh, reimbursement? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. Who wants to collect the money? Well, <laughs> I think there's something in our budget, but I'm, I'm not going to go. I, I Katie, money. is that okay? There's, there's money in the budget. For that you. address what? Yeah. Uh, you guys approved it. It's a reimbursement, right? So you'll return yes. in receipt, and then we'll reimburse you through but, the. Or do you want to just like have the Clackamas County give it to you? Because it's from them. I haven't. They haven't given me any receipt or anything. Um, have you paid them? Well, you no, and I yeah. will talk about this offline. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, Thanks. I gave the key back. <laughs> I, know. I gave the key back. <laughs> well, it's very embarrassing because our our Park Place neighborhood meets there. <laughs> We had had the meeting scheduled the night before, but we changed it because of a park place uh, steering committee meeting, and then so and everything got kind of convoluted, and then the medical situation. Oh, it's, it's so once a year you can screw up and look. Tom, like that. yes, uh, over this way. On page four, you got an E there. Just we don't have an E. You need to have corrected in your computer. We have a what on page four? A stray e. You got a stray E. Okay, I sent these to Katie. She has the original document. Again, this is nothing that we're no, going to be going it, over yeah. and talking. Yeah, but it, and that's the only thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is for the attorney to look and see if we're complete. I see it there. This is for the city attorney to see, and then we'll bring it back. And yeah. it's up to the city to direct our neighborhoods. As I told them, if they want us to implement any of these, they need to say it. And I said, we're not going to enforce this no, on any this is, neighborhood. This well, is that's just what a I template. Was going to say. It's, yeah. This is nothing you have to do. No, nothing anybody has to do. It's a it's template there, with, you know, we with will, some guidelines. The, the city will be growing. There will be other neighborhoods formed. And so now they have a, a better template is what it's okay. for. So with that, let's go right to round table. Um, you didn't tell how I got my white hair. <laughs> Was that supposed to be in the bylaws? And that's right. <laughs> um, let's start right over here. Eileen, anything to add to the round table? Well, I was just going to say, invite anybody who wants to come over to Rivercrest a week from tomorrow night. Our food is free. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your own. <laughs> we have a... A neighborhood party. Are you prepared for 600 of us to show up? What? Are you prepared for 600 of us to show up? I doubt if that many will show up. You can't find Rivercrest. I think <laughs> that's a challenge. That's a challenge. And that if like you do, if you're coming over, bring your little bicycle prepared to decorate it so you can do a, a trip around the park as a parade. And that's August 14th. Huh? It's August that's 14th. That's on the 14th. Yeah. What time? Six o'clock. Thank you. And it's a potluck. Hmm? It's a potluck, right? It's a potluck dessert. Oh. The uh, committee is furnishing the hot dogs and the pop and the potato chip, uh, that kind of stuff. Nothing helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. 
<laughs> I am pleased to announce that uh, Hale and Dale is no longer homeless. Uh, we have been invited by the uh, Living Hope Community Church to have our quarterly meeting there, and that's right on the corner of Myers and Gaffney Manor. So we really appreciate the church to uh, house our monthly meetings. Quarterly. Oh. Quarterly meetings. You know, we always need someone to push our buttons, you know? <laughs> always. Thank goodness we have Katie. Uh, August uh, steering committee meetings canceled, and that's usually held on the on the first Tuesday of the month, and we're all going to be at National Night Out. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. There was another ch chance to slide yeah. that in there. That's good. Um, but our uh, our next steering committee meeting will be held September fourth. Uh, movies in the park. One more uh, chance to promote that. We had a great turnout Friday night. I, I think probably 250, 300 thousand. people. Thousand. Oh, we had a cast of thousands. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we even had a couple of commissioners come out. It was great. The mayor came out and said hi to everyone. Um, we have four more shows this month. Wesley Lynn Park is west of Myers on Frontier Parkway. Everyone show up, bring your lawn chairs, and the, the concession stands open. Three what? I think there's three more shows. Aren't there a total? Isn't of it every Friday summer? this month? There's a total of four shows in the, this summer. Oh, okay. And we've just had one. Okay, three more. That's it. Okay, so I already told you about the volunteer um, recognition, the concerts in the park, August 9th, and then we already talked about tomorrow night, the National Night Out. And um, the only other thing I have is the American Lung Association in Oregon has provided some brochures that they would like um, the Neighborhood Association to have. And if you want more information, their contact information is on this. So I will set these in the back. And if you need additional copies made, let me know. John, anything else? Wait. In also in Hillendale, uh, there I probably should have mentioned this in Public Works. They're creating that they're they're going to be having that right turn lane off of Beaver Creek, turning on to Molala, and that's expected to be finished when next month. <coughs> they're moving right along on it, moving right along. So we'll soon have a new right turn to uh, to get from the county offices down to Fred Myers, for example, or. Is that what they've been doing? That's what they've been doing. They've been adding a right turn lane in there. And that was funded by the STCs that were paid by the county. When the county went into that area, they knew they were going to create a, be creating additional uh, traffic impact on that intersection, and so they had already ponied up the money for it. Or we had, because we're the county. Is that it? That's it. Larry? The only thing from Caulfield is our next meeting we're going to work hard to uh, get going on the 213 and Glen Oak turn signal to where it's a, what's the key word? Permissive. 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 Left turn. Left turn. Yeah. Thank you, both of we you. can do it. And uh, our last meeting we had, I think, 57 in attendance. It was at my house. And our new home is the or, uh, Beaver Creek Telephone and Cooperative Telephone. Cooperative Telephone yeah. is where we'll be having the rest of our meetings. I forget when our next meeting is, but Katie will tell me. The 26th or the 28th? 26th. 26th I think it's the 28th. 28th. That's all I have. Uh, no official announcements on a personal note. As chair, I've always tried to be at National Night Out and the volunteer, but due to this hospice situation at our house, uh, caring for a mother, I may not be able to make any of those events. It's all... <coughs> at the last minute so it may go for a while or may be denied so if I'm not there sorry I can't help you at the CIC booth but please understand of course okay That's fine. I, don't, I don't have anything to add today Thomas uh, Hazel Grove Wrestling Farms a couple of issues I wanted to discuss uh, back in January at our January meeting we had several residents came to the meeting and Voiced concern over a uh, number of activities that were going on in a on a city-owned property 
which uh, eventually will become Filbert Run Park. Uh, there were some drug activities. The police departments responded very, very nicely, came out, and we seemingly have not had any drug problems since they came out and took care of it. Uh, we do have some situations with uh, significantly tall weeds, six foot high and more, uh, and the neighborhood has agreed uh, to work with the City Parks Department, uh, provide labor to get rid of not only those weeds and other obnoxious plants that are in there, uh, but when the city purchased that property, they brought in 10 prisoners to kind of clear out blackberries and brush and so forth. Uh, those uh, piles of what they removed are still there, have been for about eight years. Uh, we find now that uh, we called the police once again because there was a dead cat found on the premises. Uh, the officer identified that as a coyote kill. It's an area where we've had children, small children, get lost, uh, unable to find their way through the park. Uh, we have a number of school children who get off of activity buses in the uh, darkened hours of the afternoon or evening in the wintertime, crossing through the park to get to other streets. Uh, we just had some general safety and emergent and uh, concerns about public safety. So we had a meeting over there a week ago with uh, Mayor Neely and Commissioner Roth and uh, City Manager Frazier and Scott Archer. And they have agreed to work with us more closely. Uh, we're getting some very good cooperation, particularly from Larry Potter now. Uh, but I know Steve has been involved and the Park Place neighborhood has been involved in some of these kinds of things. One of our plans is that we want to use this as a community building opportunity and get the word out to people in the immediate vicinity of about six blocks or so. Katie has worked with us to develop a list of those people. But could you fill me in a little bit, Stephen, what it is you do uh, to improve your area and what kind of assistance or help do you get? Uh, you know, your wife said something at the city commission meeting the other night about she wanted to thank the city commission for uh, designating more funds this year for, I guess, code enforcement or something. Maybe you could elaborate on a little bit what you're doing and, you know, what you're, what you're getting in the way of assistance. So we might ask for it too. So what we get um, is the city drops off a... Uh, yard waste recycle so we get the 10 yard okay bin which does a 10 yard adequate for 10 for yard, your um, if you have 10 to 12 people that's about what you can do in six hours okay it just depends on what you're cleaning out we were doing blackberries this last uh, <clears throat> last month okay. um, and a little slower go it was very slow go because it was a steep slope and blackberries and okay we didn't have all the people that we would ex were expecting to have either so do you do anything special to get volunteers it's something just, we could learn from <laughs> just announced okay and we get some from uh, code enforcement Okay. That, some people that they, would show up. They provide. Okay. They make them available for us. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you ask Nancy Bush for that? Yes. That I call my okay. But Steve has also that. set up a regular schedule so people know there's a certain time of the month. So they but they I'm know watching. rather well, next month it's this date, following months it's that date. So. Oh, that'll be on my. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate your sharing that. <coughs> Um, Kanima had a, uh, a joint meeting with Metro uh, in uh, the Metro Kanima National Area. They plan on tr doing a project to enhance uh, White Oak across the Kanima Bluff. And in the process of doing that, uh, they want to take out 150 fir trees um, as part of this project to try to eliminate their impact on creating shade 
uh, but in doing so, uh, they are impacting the Canemus, uh, historic Canema Cemetery Road, which is uh, really the uh, extension of the wagon road out of Oregon City from 1830 through 1850, and was the, before that the native trail, uh, in a, of, and it's of a, a significant importance, historic uh, importance. But we had this meeting with uh, Metro, and you're dealing with uh, the the White Ivory Tower Mecca Mega entity out of uh, Portland, telling us uh, exactly what they wanted to do, and uh, we kept on trying to explain to them this that this was a natural area, and we hoped that they understood what natural area meant, and that not necessarily meant cutting down a lot of trees and running big tractors and doing things but yet at the same time they won't let us take a dog into there because the dogs do far too much damage to this uh, historic area but a D9 cat uh, <laughs> uh, can run over this area and uh, pull out a hundred and, uh, and a skitter and we can pull out all of these trees so we have a few disagreements in principle with what their plan is but uh, as usual, the big bureaucracy moves along, and we had a report before the city commission by Carlotta Collette last Wednesday saying all is well and the plan is perfect, and they are proceeding down the path of saying that that the neighborhood had full agreement with uh, in the city with uh, <laughs> with the plans, and so as usual, uh, I can just report that the neighborhood has a more than a slight disagreement with the plan, but uh, uh, we don't know whether we're going to have traction, but uh, we're not afraid to tell everyone uh, that not necessarily is um, cutting down 150 significant fir trees and uh, running skitters and tractors and stuff in a natural area exactly what the neighborhood want, would like to see happen but uh, we don't know whether that'll happen or not. You mean the last of the 150? They already got the rest. They've they've already they went through and did a, a major uh, annihilation about uh, uh, three years ago, uh, where they graded the historic road and went in and uh, into areas where uh, tens of thousands of Native Americans died with the uh, disease epidemics. And so this was a transit uh, uh, encampment site all along the whole Kanema Bluff of uh, these families coming from all over the western region to fish at the Willamette Falls. And when they got the diseases, they got it down at the falls. They took it up to their campsite. They all got sick and died. They put their bodies on platforms. They let them their spirits go to their native spiritual heaven. They kicked the body off and put another body on. But spiritually, the Kanema Bluff and the Kanema areas of great historic and spiritual significance, and we're trying to protect it. Uh, it's not a simple battle. I know Michael has been out there, and we've had a lot of different people that helped. And any of you that feel that you would like to know more about it, uh, please l let us know, or, or would like to help us uh, uh, fight the. Uh, uh, the Portland bureaucracy of Metro, uh, we'll, we'll, re we'll take your help. Thank you. Done. So I broke the law when I walked my dog over there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you did. Absolutely. Well, yeah, you you did it on camera? Well, I feel good about that. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, uh, is it handicap accessible? Because I want to walk my dog over there too. Is your bad handicap? No, I I will honestly tell you, I showed up at a metro meeting with my two uh, standard poodles uh, with me, as I and I walked them with me uh, at one of the meetings just to make a statement. Well, we have nothing like that at Barclay Hills. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, William uh, chaired our last meeting, and we had about what twenty three, twenty four people, something like that. It was pretty good, and. Uh, Collected a little more money. We have a couple hundred bucks in the bank now. Excuse me. Yes. I really need to point out. Yes. That Barclay Hills is the only neighborhood association that I've been to, and I think I've been to every neighborhood association meeting one time or another, that actually passes a hat. No, it's a, it's a tambourine, actually. <laughs> well, they meet in <laughs> the church, church, and they church. pass a tambourine around yeah. and collect 
loose change. Well, did you see the, the bucket of loose change that somebody brought? You know, that, yeah. That was like 82 bucks. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, we, we do collect a little money. We don't have any ice cream cones to sell like this. But uh, we are getting some paving. Uh, we, thanks to uh, John and the city, we're, we're getting uh, some action on those that turn situation we have up there, and that's really good. Um, I understand that uh, CenturyLink is now putting fiber optics in underneath there in, in, in advance of the paving, is that right? They put in all new terminals and everything and wow, so we might be real spiffy just real soon. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And we may have a chairperson, uh, right? At the next meeting we're going to vote on a new chairperson. So yes. I won't mention names, but we'll what? I thought Was that just a nomination we got? Or I thought it's a nomination, yeah, because... We got we have there the bylaws say we have to announce it and all that. Okay. I know his dog's name. <laughs> Dharma. Has Dharma. He, has he been to Kanima? <laughs> <laughs> I'll invite him. No, I wouldn't do that. He could have a record. He could have a police record. Oh, excuse me. Are you going to mention about the attacking dog issue? I wasn't, but all right. Uh, my dog. So, uh, my dog was attacked by these uh, same two mutts that. Uh, uh, attacked a whole bunch of dogs last year and they got out again and um, it goes beyond just the dogs because I, I filed a report with the with the county dog services and all of a sudden I got the owner of the dog at my door trying to talk me out of doing that and I said well I'm not going to do that so I don't want you on my door sorry um, and then he's writing things in our Facebook page that we're all racists and I said well Maybe we are, but you know, uh, <laughs> your, your dogs are still biting our dogs. <laughs> so you know, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a piece of. I think he's a piece of work. Uh, then uh, so we took him off our Facebook page because he was he was being so. He was, well, he was. I'm on. He was writing something every day that against any of us naming names and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Come on. We tried to tell him to stop. He didn't do it. So we took him off. And then all of a sudden, this woman asked to join the Facebook page. And it turns out to be his wife, who has a different name than he does. And he's actually changed his name from the last uh, time he was cited. So uh, we have interesting times. Is, is that what you wanted to hear? That's well, what I wanted to hear. Uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Now that you have experience with those, we'll send all of those down. No. no. Um, we have our neighborhood association meeting September 20th. Uh, the postcard is going to has gone to Katie, and she's going to get it in the mail. I'd like to thank everybody that supported Villa Stocking, Villa Heart for the second barbecue, and we had Ray Gordon singing, which was a uh, great fun. Love the kids that help us and volunteer, and th thank people for participating and. Thank Tom for arranging that meeting with the powers to be of Oregon City. So we, because that was in our first meeting with part of the powers to be. So she, he just went a little higher, and I appreciate him doing that due diligence. So we, because actually that grass is a fire hazard. So it would, you know, continue up those trees and could do home, home damage to the homes. So thank you. That's it. Ingra. Well, we're from the South End Neighborhood Association, and the newsletter did come out. We're having our meeting um, at 6.30 on the 16th of August, which is the third Thursday, and we're going to be meeting at uh, Chapin Park this time for an outdoor meeting, and the first 50 people who attend will get a free hot dog that is um, donated by Alex Sausage Kitchen. And the speaker is going to be Larry Didway, the superintendent of the Oregon City School District. And he'll be talking about um, the recent closures of the two schools that affect our neighborhood and what the, um, well, the future of Oregon City Schools in the South End neighborhood and the recent closure of those schools. And then if you want to check on the newsletter on the website, um, page th two and three will give you the results of the college student survey that the neighborhood did. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a little bit hard to read the color coding, but um, it gives you some of the information that we had. So 
I think that's about all we have. But it's going to be the third Thursday of this month that we'll have the South End Neighborhood Association meeting at Chapin Park. David, anything? Yes. Okay, Amy. And thank you, Katie. <laughs> I was actually out of state for the Gaffney Lane meeting. William, do you have anything to report there? Are you able to go to that? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, let me see. Who do we? Oh, we had um, we had uh, two police officers. We had Officer Hayes and uh, Booker uh, came and talked to the neighbors about uh, uh, safety during the summer. And uh, we also had um, uh, Yes, Andrea Schulmack about National Night Out came in and made a presentation about National Night Out. And then we had a, a surprise guest speaker of uh, uh, Maureen Cole, the library director, came and uh, told folks about what the library uh, programs were, were doing in the summer. It was well attended. As usual, they had, they had gobs of cookies and, uh, and scads of, I mean, you want punch, you want lemonade, you want iced tea, you, want, you know, and all these handmade cookies. They they treat us so nice there. It's a nice neighborhood. No, it was it was reasonably well attended. Uh, for, I think for the summertime it was fun. We're still looking for a chair and a secretary, correct? Yes, but we did have a couple new members there that had never attended before. Alice. Yes, uh, the McLaughlin neighborhood met in June for the general meeting, and then in July. No, I might have my. I got my months wrong. Okay. July and then August was our steering committee and our next general meeting will be on the first Thursday in September which happens to be the 6th. I don't have the speaker list yet but we meet at the fire hall at 7 p.m. And I wanted to thank Katie for doing such a good job. When your uh, presentation about the budgets was very helpful and last time I commented during this period of our meeting, I was kind of grousing around about the budget and how we didn't have enough for our newsletter. But we did one of the postcards that is slightly less costly than a newsletter. And then you, in turn, sent out all those emails to remind people that to come. And we had a wonderful turnout. So after all my grousing around, I found that there were ways around a money situation, and it was very gratifying, and I really appreciated your help on that. And then uh, lastly, we are selling snow cones at the three remaining concerts in the park. It's too bad that your meeting is on the same night as the concerts in the park, because it's a great opportunity to come out and meet the, the whole city. It's well attended. And it's, the music is always great. Ray Gordon was there last time, and she was, she's always excellent. And the last one of the month is Johnny Limbo and the Lug Nuts, and I wouldn't want anyone to miss that. So, Steve. Um, Steve Van Haverbeek from Park Place. Um, the city does provide more than I just mentioned because they provide tools and gloves and water, mulch if we need it. So vests, vests, and grabbers for uh, doing road cleanups. So they're very supportive. Um, what what department in particular? Oh, that's that's still through uh, Nancy Bush or code enforcement. So it's all for code enforcement. Um, on August 18th, we are planning a cleanup of the straight. Um, Pioneer Cemetery and a painting of the uh, white picket fence. So nice that the uh, Clackamas River Drive has been brought down so you can actually see that from the uh, the road now. Steve? Of course you can't drive on that road. But <laughs> can I ask a question? Do you put up flyers for in the neighborhood so people know that you're doing it that weekend? Um, just distributed to uh, the steering committee, and we can haven't been. Uh, okay, I didn't know if there was anything like that special, or leave it notice Steve, at um, the store. As he does, he did, there's a store there, but also they've got their steering committee. They've got a contact with the the Clackamas. Uh, um, what's it called? The Oregon View Manor. So there's a lot of people there in the local churches. They they work the the. Uh, the whole, the, whole, the whole community. Yes. Since okay. the uh, since the cleanup is going to be at the Pioneer Cemetery, I don't know if you've reached out to Barclay Hills, which is in their neighborhood. 
No, it's a different. Oh, the other pioneer cemetery. Oh, the great pioneer cemetery. Ah, the old one. The other one. Okay. It's a small little one. Got it. Yeah, I think there's. The one that you couldn't see until they did the interchange. Until they brought the road down. Yep, got it. And that will be on 18th. August 18th, and we will meet there. Um, what time is that? 9 o'clock, I think. Hopefully it won't be 100 degrees. August 20th, uh, <coughs> the PP&A Steering Committee will be meeting at the Red Community Building. Uh, we will also be meeting on September 17th, the steering committee again. Our next general meeting is October 15th. Uh, we also have a uh, cleanup in September and October, but uh, the September cleanup is on the 15th of September. That one we're planning to do our gateways again and probably do a uh, Holcomb road cleanup. So it's been working great. We've gotten a lot of great comments from people who love to see that can actually see the uh, the gateways. So yeah. it's been great. Thanks Dave. Looks good. Uh, Rachel Gunderson with the Oregon City Chamber of Commerce and we would like to invite you to the annual open air antique fair. Uh, that is coming up at the end of August. It is Sunday, August 26th from 8 to 4. Um, if you have anything that you would like to have appraised, there is going to be an appraiser on site, a few of them. So from 9.30 until 3, you can bring your items to be appraised. Um, it's a limit of three items, uh, $5 each. Um, and we also welcomed four new members to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have Sherry Goff, who is an attorney off of Warner Milne. Uh, Mount Angel Publishing, who is the group that will now be publishing the um, Oregon City Around Town magazine. Uh, the fall issue is coming out um, in October. Uh, Oregon City Together is a nonprofit organization that uh, promotes um, drug and alcohol free lifestyle for. Um, well, for our youth, but particularly the middle school age kids. Um, and then also we have First City Cycles, um, who is on Main Street. Um, they're in the old um, Hops Upholstery Building. Um, so they specialize in um, more well, specialized bicycles, um, repairs, tools, parts, etc. And um, through the end of August, they are offering bike tune-ups for uh, $50, which is $25 off of their regular price. We got two more people behind there, so <coughs> that bike place so is that it? They, had, they just tuned up my bike. Okay, so next we go to John. Has a couple more comments to make. Um. Yeah, sorry for not mentioning these earlier, but it, it occurred to me as I was listening. Um, Commissioner Kathy Roth asked this question at the last commission meeting, and so I followed up. County, um, if you've been down to the courthouse, there's a courtyard down there. There's a fountain. That fountain is not working right now. I talked to uh, Jeff Jorgensen with the uh, county offices. He's their facility manager. He told me that they that those there is a basalt fountain. So if you haven't seen it, it's several pillars of basalt. One of them is cracking, and the reason it's fenced, I thought, was because of our construction oh, project. But um, the reason that that is fenced is because they're worried about that breaking away. Unfortunately, what he tells me is they brought in experts and they um, are certain that that's going to fall away and there's not a way to repair that. So that fountain and the future of that fountain as it stands today is in question. Um, they're also uh, pursuing, pursuing a, uh, <clears throat> they're also pursuing an addition onto the courthouse. So you may have heard this through your planning uh, yeah. committee. Yeah. There's a so there's a sally port is what they call it. It's basically so the, tr the police vehicles can bring um, detainees, I suppose, in, in <coughs> under a roof, close the door, and get them in, in, inside the courthouse. But the key piece to that is, is that uh, they'll be erecting a temporary fence that will be set back from the sidewalk a few feet, kind of behind the pergola or the, the 
trellis that they have there, it'll be set back, so you won't have much access to the little courtyard. Um, and it's a six to nine month project, so that will include our Christmas lighting ceremony this year, so we won't have access to that little facility this year. So I'm not sure exactly what the plan is. Now I understand Nancy Bush is also working on that one. She's pretty integral to our Christmas tree lighting program, so she'll, we'll probably come up with some kind of solution. And one other little item. Um, we've been, uh, city manager and through the city commission has been adamant about the city planting more heritage trees. These are larger trees, trees that will um, last uh, for a very, very long time, something that wouldn't be necessarily in a planter strip to damage sidewalks, but something that would be in an area that would be uh, there for uh, longer than most of us. So oak trees, large leaf maples, um, red oaks. Uh, so I know Park Place, we planted a bunch in Park Place along that trail and through the so uh, like welcome. There's ten of them right. just within right. half a mile of my house that they put in. Yeah, so we're watering those through the summer, through bags, and the, there's uh, some on Washington Street near Abernathy. Uh, there's one down near uh, Sportcraft Marina out on Beaver Creek Road we planted, and these are larger diameters, so they're, you know, I, I think larger, but they're really more like three inch caliper trees, four inch caliper trees. And um, so, anyway, that's a new initiative that uh, uh, apparently has some support, so we're, we're trying to meet that. I don't remember how many we planted, but we planted quite a few. City's paying for that. As long as we're on that subject and you brought a park place, um, I'm not sure if Steve's noticed it or we need to take a picture, but I, they put in those great lamp posts all up and down Holcomb when they redid the sidewalks. It's covered with... Well, it's completely covered with vines so the light's on all the time because it doesn't get any. And one's turned opaque like the bulb must have exploded. Um, and I turned saw it. that. I walked your neighborhood not too long ago and I actually did see I that. I thought that was you. I took that, a picture you know. of it. Actually. But that vine one kind of like, what is that? I thinking that I'm going to walk by there and... I took a picture and then I it's in deep in my computer. Yeah. I thought it was a hanging basket at first. <laughs> so with that, I think, believe that if there's nothing else, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much. The long